Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Here at Cabinets HR, we're launching a crowdfunding campaign on the Refund of Crowdfunder app. To learn more how you can support us and become an early investor at Cabinets HR, go to https refund.com slash Cabinets HR. Our guest today is Alan Gonzalez. Alan, ready to be great today? Good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So, Alan, when's the last time you played soccer? Oh, the last time I played soccer was a few months ago. Because uh, I actually left the team that I was, uh, but I had been playing soccer for like ten years. Um, but I actually left because there was so much, much going on. It isn't working right. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, so, what position do you play? Oh uh, well, because I play on a small kind of indoor field. It's kind of all over. Okay. Um, but every almost everything except goalkeeper. So, do you like play in high school or college or anything? Or just all been like you know on the fun on the side. Thing you do almost always fun on the side. Uh, when I was in school, I did wanted to play like with the rest of the teams, but I I was never varsity. I was I was always the B team. Okay. Yeah. Um, how often do you go to Sano games? Oh, not that often. Uh, actually, yeah. no, maybe once a year. Do you? Yeah. yeah. You have any like any favorite soccer team that are here in the U.S. or anywhere in the world? No, not really. I just watch it uh, okay. for the fun of it. Uh, something I do obsess about a little bit uh, is maybe the World Cup. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's gonna be here. What 2025, 20, 2026, I think here. Yes, in yes. Man, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta, I want to get a ticket, but man, it's gonna be hard to get a ticket. They'll probably go pretty fast. Mm -hmm. You know, they're gonna be, they could probably expensive as hell too. That's right, that's right. And and I don't, I've never purchased a ticket for the World Cup. I think it involves lottery. And yeah, probably it's, so. It's not as straightforward. Yeah, and then it was crazy. Is like this World Cup, that World Cup is gonna be like in Canada, United States, and Mexico. So that's I know the U.S. has games in Seattle, Dallas. Yes other places right so that might make tickets getting the tickets even harder because like it's not like all the world cup games in seattle there might be like maybe four or five here in mm -hmm. seattle maybe i mean i have no idea but it's gonna be hard most of the visitors um to the world cups across the world are just kind of coming from the u.s so now that yeah. it's going to be in the u.s yeah it's gonna be tough to get tickets i know can you imagine the hotel prices don't work up uh, thankfully i uh <laughs> i have a home around yeah exactly cool um the next talk about your guitar playing mm. That's something you picked up recently or you've already no, been doing it? No, that's when I I picked up the guitar when I was like in third grade in an elementary. And I remember having a guitar player, a, a guitar, like the, the instructor, he would come up with songs on the fly about us. Uh, they were funny and just kind of just, it was amazing. It was just a fun thing to do. And then in like sixth grade in elementary i got to put i got to be with the like the middle school guitar uh band so that was kind of a proud moment for me that we were chosen like three kids from elementary moved up to the like the next level guitar uh, now do you did you play like rock guitar or other kind of guitar? like what kind of actual guitar music did you play i play acoustic guitar okay um i actually did start a band with my okay. wife okay. and two other friends and I started playing guitar, uh, electric guitar, but I'm not good. I'm really not. No, it was, it was tough, but it was mostly for fun. Yeah. When was the last time you played in front of people? In front of people? In no, we, people. We, I've never played. Maybe the last time I played in front of people was at my wife's uh, birthday. Okay. And yeah, uh, we, we, I, we had a party and then there was a person playing guitar and I just took it from him and started playing. With so her. question, when you, when you did this for you, like kind of drunk and just went in 40, like no, you were sober, I was not drunk. No, no, you know, no. you're like, you know, how some people like they do stuff and they're drunk. Like, you know, yes. I don't, I really like playing the guitar in front of people, but I'm, I'm, I'm had a few drinks, you know, uh -huh. no, no, no. This was kind of lighthearted and it was fun. Thanks. So next, um, what kind of dog you have? I have a poodle dog, uh, that we found in the streets of Mexico. Yeah, so it's, he's like a true like street dog in the sense that we just picked them up from the streets. Uh, so you, so you all just saw him and your heart and your heart's broke. Or well, not mine, my wife. Your wife, your wife's yeah, heart yeah, broke. Yeah. Like, she, she, she's like, we're taking this dog home with us, Alan. That's right. I don't that's care right. what you say. And and uh, she she was asking me, um, should we do this? Mm -hmm. um, and then I said, well, if you're gonna take care of him and all that stuff, and she's like, no, 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 because the moment this dog comes with us then it's going to be both our responsibility mm -hmm. and i said yeah that's fine and yeah. it's a lot of responsibility oh, yeah. it's a lot just uh, like having a kid <laughs> pretty much and so, how long have you had the dog 
Huh? How long have you had the uh, dog? Four or five years. Okay. Yeah. So, and that dog was in Mexico. So, of course, we had to go through a bunch of process to kind of bring him into the U.S. Mm. Um, but yeah. So the dog had to get a green card. <laughs> <laughs> he actually did, sort of. And then, and then we we when the dog came over here, we went through training. So he also got like education. So he's. Do you have to know how the dog? Can you can someone tell you how old the dog is? How does that work? I don't know. When we took him to the vet. Um, they look at the paws mm -hmm. and I guess based on the where mm -hmm. that the, the paws have, uh, they told us that it was one year old. Okay. Yeah. So pretty, not very. But how accurate is that if the dog was in the street, you know, on the street, the semen like tearing his paws up every day? Uh, that's what I would think. Uh, but um, I guess I trust the vet there. Yeah. The one true. thing I did notice is that when, when we first got him, um, we cut all of the, I don't know what's the word, um, what are you talking about? Yeah, all the hair. And he has a really big scar, like, mm. across the face. So mm. probably has a lot of stories. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Who knew Puro Puro getting out there doing dog fighting? <laughs> I didn't know that, no. Yeah. Um, what's the last book you read? The last book I read, it's actually one I'm reading right now, is uh, The Idealist. It talks about the story of Jeffrey Sachs and how he wants to earl, um, uh, end world hunger uh, in Africa. Yeah. What kind of books do you usually read? Um, I used to read a lot of kind of technical books. And then I started doing um, reading club with a few friends. My wife is there and a few other friends from Mexico. And, we, and, and that really opened up my eyes to reading all sorts of things that I would never, ever read. Um, but I usually read uh, nonfiction more, more than anything, just kind of. And I, I like to read business and as of late, um, anything that is just kind of relaxing. Okay. Like, uh, yeah. So what's a book you read that like, you really liked? Like you could read this book like over and over and over again. Mm. What's the name? I don't, I don't remember the name, but... Um, it talks about the journey that migrants take from Mexico to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And there, it's this um, person that really documents the journey. And he gives cameras, disposable cameras to the, to the migrants as they're going. And they take pictures uh, on their journey. And it's just like, It really kind of opened up my eyes because, you know, migration, we all know that it happens yeah. and that it's not great and all that stuff. But like reading from people and their stories and how much they fight for a minimum wage job yeah. in the U.S. and all that stuff. It was really, really eye opening and something that I truly recommend other people to look into um, just kind of makes you appreciate even more the small things that you have, everything that you have. And yeah. So next part, we're definitely gonna go back to migration in a minute, but next part of the question, this might be even harder for your answer. Mm. What's a book you read? You're like, I've just wasted like two or three hours of my life reading this crap. Like mm. you was like, you could erase the, that time from your life. Like this was a complete waste of time. This book is book horrible. Yeah. Because it was horrible. I don't, I don't remember, but I do remember reading books that um, not wasted time, but I really didn't understand anything about what is being said. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like if I didn't read it. Yeah. Um, one of them being the labyrinth of solitude. Okay. Um, I just kind of went over my head. Uh, another one, the Steppenwolf. Mm -hmm. It's just like I, this is too dense. I like, <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Nice. And then you still play video games? I do. Yeah. Well. As when a few months, not so much, yeah. but uh, I try. I think any, about them. <laughs> any of your favorite ones? I am a big fan of Zelda. Okay. Yeah. All so right. I know the the newest Zelda installment just came out, but I haven't purchased it because yeah. I know that. You waste too much time playing it versus doing your business. Well, yeah. Yeah. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. So when you back when you were like really playing video games, do you like experiment with different ones? Or you just like. You may, maybe like maybe played in Madden or played like World of Warcraft or like play different games. You just no, like you have like a one genre or genre you stick to. I don't have a genre. Um, 
from growing up, it was mostly kind of spending time with my friends, just kind of mostly multiplayer games, like, you know, Mario Kart, the Smash Brothers, anything that would put, like, get a lot of people in the room. Uh, those were kind of my, one of the big memories that I have. And the other one, of course, is just be playing by myself, like a Zelda game by myself. Like, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So back to migration, right? I mean, everyone has their opinions on it, right? On the, on the one hand, like, you know, people, they will say, like, they'll come, come and take our jobs. But, like, mm -hmm. I don't know if every America is trying to get paid, you know, like, I think it's, like, 20 cents a bucket to pick peaches or apples or whatever like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not happening, right? And then, like, people are saying, you know, oh, the migrants are coming from Mexico. And in reality, I actually come from Honduras, Guatemala, Venezuela, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's, it's a complicated thing, right? With no easy answer. On, on the one hand, people will say, well, they should follow the laws. But, like, if you come from Honduras and you get, like, seeing people get killed every day, like you're trying to get, take better care of family and what you're going to do. Right. Yeah. It's, it's not easy. I think definitely not easy. Um, and I mean, I grew up, um, in a big part of my growing up was in Texas. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of migration, a lot of people yeah. coming. Um, and I don't know, I, I've thought about this, but like, is it because you come into a country and you know that your status is kind of not legal, mm -hmm. so you tend to mm, not break the law. Yeah. I mean, and with that same person, if they were in their country of origin, would that would that same person not break the law over there? That's a good point. So, I personally think that because you know you, you are, uh, your status is not, I mean, with and you do something and then you're kicked out, mm -hmm. you tend to behave better in this country, okay. in, in a country where you're not supposed to be. Um, and then of course there's people that just don't, don't care. Like yeah, you'll do whatever you do, wherever you are, regardless of your status. Um, are they coming to take jobs? I mean, yes, they are taking jobs. Do uh, people that are living here want to do those jobs? Probably not. Uh, are they okay? And they, because they are also in this kind of status, they tend not to make a big fuss about uh, being taken advantage of or exactly, like being screwed over. Exactly, you know, exactly. You know, oh, not getting a raise and stuff too. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I know when, uh, when I retired from the Army, my first job, I, I worked at a, at a seafood plant up in Alaska, right? Mm -hmm. And like all the workers were like on the line, like the fish that they're either like Filipinos or like Somalian or like third country Africans, you know, mm -hmm. we could never get some of the United States. It's like, they wouldn't do it. Cause it was yeah. like backpacking work. And we paid good money, you know, like, you know, they got paid got people average like six, $7,000 a month for what we're doing up there, but it's, it's backpacking work and no American would do it. Maybe we had like a couple of Americans up there, right? But that was it, right? It's yeah. the Filipinos and, you know, the same thing with, um, I never heard about this, but in Florida, there's passed some kind of immigration law where like, if you're like an employer, you'll be some kind of big, something happened, right? So now pretty much all the, you know, potentially undocumented workers are just left floored. Like there's no construction jobs, people, they're not, no one to pick the fruits or whatever. And then a, then a video of this one lady, like, oh, I'll do the job. Like she quit after 30 minutes. Like I can't yeah. do this, you know? That's right, that's right. And then one thing too, they were like, you know, like, I think they get paid, like I'm making this up like a dollar a bucket, whatever. Mm -hmm. And the most American, like dollar, you know? And so this one American made like 20 bucks for one day, right? Cause she couldn't do it right. Or usually they would pay like, you know, uh, um, a regular worker like three, four dollars a day, right? Cause they know how to do it so fast, right? So America, like, you know, you need to get paid like $30 an hour. Like the former, like, I can't afford to pay people $30 an hour, you know? So it's, yeah. it's just, yeah, I don't know. It's tough. Um, one, one of the ideas, I mean, at some point, um, can we do something that basically improves the living of people in, in their countries of origin yeah. such that they don't want to yeah. emigrate uh, and if they do it's because of, if it's, it's a choice it's a personal choice not mm -hmm. because you need to and one of the things that really stops that from happening in my opinion is kind of corruption yeah and i've been really thinking about well what are the potential ways in which we can kind of reduce corruption in the countries of origin and maybe the person that came into power um, has a good heart and he or she um, started with, with, with the right intentions, but in the journey of getting to the power, yeah. then it gets corrupted. What's the thing 
power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolute, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yes, absolutely. So what are the tools that we have today such that we can kind of change some of that as well? Some of the things uh, I was thinking, uh, I mean, it's obvious. I mean, like having some sort of uh, computer system that would intervene or that the absolute decision wouldn't be just in one person. I mean, in this book that we're, I'm reading right now, um, uh, they talk about not having doctors in Africa, in rural Africa. And so here in the U.S., it's like AI is being regulated um, in one of those regulations. Well, AI is like not supposed to or not should not make a medical diagnosis. Well, when your alternative is having no diagnosis at all, what could go wrong? Well, I guess a lot of things could go wrong, but what what is the downside the terrible downside of having an ai doctor in rural africa yeah. well the, where the alternatives not having anything at all and the patient's just dying uh, in the same sense could we have some sort of decision maker governmental decision maker that is ai that can assist or that can not because they we don't have anything but because they can make decisions um and in some ways not being enticed by corruption yeah. in, the, in the same sense that a human does. Now, is that going to be unbiased? No, it's not going to be unbiased. It's going to be completely biased on how it is being trained. But I still think that that might be better than just going around and paying the judge a money and then yeah. having him or her um, uh, vote in your favor. Yeah. No one that kills me, like, no, people are like, oh, they're all coming to like do crime and drugs, whatever. And Cause I know some are true, but like, you gotta think like this single mother walking to three kids from Honduras, like thousand of miles, like, are you kidding me? Right? Like mm -hmm. just to get a better life. Another thing that kills me too, like, you know, like, like border town, like Brownsville, El Paso, there's a big t a town of Arizona, a lot of them go through, right? And then like, and I know like, you know, I know like Governor Abbott and the governor from Florida, a lot of criticism for like shipping something like New York City, Chicago, mm -hmm. and, like, and like New York City, like we can't handle this, right? Like, are you kidding, right? You're, you're New York City, right? You're the one saying, you know, bring other people over here. Yeah. Like, you know, give this border town some relief, right? Yeah. I know. I know the biggest one. They, um, I think Governor Sanders. I'm not saying it's good or bad. Mm -hmm. It was a him or Governor Abbott. They sent like a hundred immigrants on a bus to um, Martha's Vineyard, right? Yeah. And Martha's Vineyard, like, supposed to be like this, you know, progressive far left, you know, like all kumbaya. And like, I. I'm making this up maybe like within two weeks, I got rid of all the immigrants, right? Mm. And they didn't want to take care of, you know? So yeah. it's, I just think it's hypocritical to say, you know, bring everyone over here, but then, you know. When you actually have the problem in your hands. Yeah, it's yeah. a big difference, right? Cause like, I don't know, a Paso, you know, like a Paso, Brownsville, and like, yeah, it's. It's tough. Um, and then, when, but when you do put yourself in the migrants' shoes, like what's your alternative? Yeah. Like getting killed, just not having food. You're going to do whatever you want, you, whatever you need to do to get to a better life. Yeah. Uh, and so. I don't think most Americans don't think either, like, you know, they're, they're in, their better life is like a minimum wage job, you know, picking fruit or working yeah. McDonald's, right? I mean, it's not like they're coming here and become the CEO of Apple, right? Right, right. Or become, you know, they're not coming to, they're not coming to be the CTO of DevMatch or something like that, making $100,000. They're like, bare existence, you know, like, yeah. which is, and it's a better life for them, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's tough. I don't know. Like I like to say people are way smarter and with way more money than me haven't figured out yet. So, <laughs> well, let me just say that the uh, CEO of DevMatch uh, is also a minimum wage job yeah. right, right yeah. now. <laughs> for now, yeah. For now, yeah. For now, yeah. Uh, so, were you born in Texas or Mexico? I was born in Mexico. Okay. Uh, but I did go to elementary school when I was, uh, I did elementary in Houston, Texas. Okay. In fifth, uh, fourth and fifth year grade. Okay. And then I went back to Mexico and then I came back for some high school in Houston as okay. well. Then I finished my school and then I came to the, to Seattle. It was great for you. Like, so the years, the, the years in Houston, right? You go back to Mexico. You go back to Mexico, your friends like, oh, you're a fucking gringo Mexican, you're mm. Texan, you know, do they make fun of you for that or? No, not really. I don't recall that. Uh, maybe because my my very first like five, six years were in Mexico, mm. I didn't stand out that much. Okay. Like, because uh, I know there's a lot of um, Chicanos, what they call. Uh, that's what he had there. Yeah, yeah, I haven't heard that term in a long time. That, 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 I'm from Texas too, yeah. I that's heard that, right. I heard that term in a long time. You can tell a Chicano in Mexico. Yeah. But I, I think I... Uh, I don't know. I I just nobody really noticed yeah. that, that. 
So why did you decide mm-hmm. to move to Seattle of all the different places? Because I was offered a job at okay. Microsoft. That's a, that's a good reason. <laughs> yeah. That's a pretty good reason to move somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, a, it was a great opportunity. So what got you interested in software development, coding, and all that kind of tech stuff? I think it must have come from my uncle. Uh, my uncle, uh, David, he was a programmer. He's like 10 years older than me. And he was taking care of me. And I mean, what I was maybe eight years old. And the thing that he asked me to do, like kind of to pass the time was to program code. So we had a computer. And how old were you when you started? Eight, eight, eight years old. Yeah. And so one thing, like, of course, schools get a lot of criticism about other things. One of my criticisms was like, they don't start teaching code like maybe junior, senior high school, right? Mm-hmm. Like, how do how, how can we influence like schools to start doing this like, like elementary school? Like, because coding is like a, something everyone needs to know, especially just right. people coming up, right? Like, why do you think there's such a disconnect there? Well, it's uh, relatively new um, in terms of other kind of professions, like, uh, I don't know, doctors or uh, lawyers, all that stuff. Um, but uh, a, a, a career, a successful career in computers, uh, something that is relatively new, I think. So maybe that will happen. And certainly we're seeing some of that. Like uh, when you have a career in computers, uh, you're, it's usually good paid. And I think that's going to reflect the, the school's uh, curriculum. Uh, but exactly what you're saying is... Uh, something that I've been advocating for a long time, like uh, telling a computer what to do is something that is kind of lit, like technical literacy is important, whether you are an attorney, a doctor, a farmer, or anything, there's always benefit from knowing what computers can help you do um, and how to use them to your benefit. So that means just kind of teaching computer science earlier in your education. From your time doing all this kind of tech stuff, are some people like more inclined to be successful software developers that like certain characteristics they need or not need? Maybe 10 years ago, I would have said yes. Uh, but today I don't think so. Um, I think you mostly need to be able, or you need to enjoy solving problems or being able to kind of focus. I think that's a critical um, aspect of this, not necessarily, not all software, not all great software engineers are exactly the same. Um, as I progress and I meet more software engineers, there are many, there's a wide range of software engineers. Like there's this person that is incredibly hardcore and can diagnose the most incredible problems uh, at the micro level, at the systems level. Then there's the fantastic software engineer that is also uh, salesperson like somebody that can sell the 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 engineer but they're also a software engineer they can and they end up not selling sort of um products but ideas or convincing people to do things in some way yeah. like i think we should do this architecture and um, people don't agree well now you have to kind of convince them or sell to them that this is how it should be done so it, it's a wide range. Uh, it's no longer the person that is kind of all night in their computer, just kind of hacking something, um, which what I, is what I thought a great engineer was. And, but nowadays, no, it's, it, there's a wide range of skills uh, that you can use to become a great software engineer. Yeah, one thing I like about it is that anyone can do it, right? Because I, I used to follow this guy on YouTube. I think I should follow him, right? Like he was like seven years old, you like, he just posts on YouTube, I know what I'm doing. I want to learn how to do Python, right? He would post videos every day if you want to learn Python, right? And eventually, yeah. like, post some great stuff. Like, man, this is fucking cool as shit, right? This guy, seven years old, retired. He wants to do something. He says he learned, he taught himself Python using YouTube. He, he documented all the, all, all in this, like, that, like yeah, that, that goes like 10 years ago when I was, when I was describing what I thought a great software engineer was. A friend of mine told me that uh, great software engineers are kind of hard to find. And that he told me this. If you're not a if you're not a great programmer, you're never gonna be. Yeah. Because it, you can learn it yourself. You can push yourself. You can do it yourself. And and, and there's so many resources. Kind of almost talking to yourself and just kind of working until you succeed to a problem. Um, 
I thought it was very much true when he said that to me. Nowadays, I, I'm not sure. I think a lot of this stuff can be taught. Another thing that I heard uh, recently, for instance, is that only 0.05% of the world population know how to code. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised it's that high, to be honest with you. And we live in a digital world. We live in a world where only of the world population can create. So imagine if we lived in a world where only 0.05% uh, of the people knew how to read and write. Or, yeah. And so now with all the technology advancing um, and allowing people to be able to create software, um, that 0 0.05 is going to grow. So it's, it's going to, it's, it's only going to make it better, I think, because uh, more ideas are going to be translated into programs. Yeah. So. And as you point five of code, you know, like how them are actually good coders, right? Yeah. Like, it's probably even lower, like, you know, anyone, yes, you know, but how many actually, like, you know, like building was, stuff and like, you know, actually, much, like, you know, much smaller than that. So I actually, and that's I, why those people get the big, big bucks. Yeah, exactly. And I actually, when I heard this quote, I do dove into doing some research, seeing if I could trace the source of this. 0.05 percent and yeah. what it means how do you count somebody uh, and i couldn't find it yeah. <laughs> uh there's there's some uh pages there that do have this number but i'm still yet to find yeah. uh the true meaning of this number but it's still the point i think is still correct that there's very 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 few individuals that know how to code here's one for you so supposedly like let's suppose like suppose i i, I i've never played a guitar i say i want a guitar but i spend one hour, just one hour a week for one year practicing guitar. After that one year with only one hour a week, I'm better than 95% of the people in the world at mm -hmm. guitar, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not a high barrier to become like top 5% in anything, yeah. right? So that's right. That's right. That's what I'm saying. Most of what you need is the ability to um, focus. First, you need some sort of incentive, like an incentive mm -hmm. of to do something, to do anything. You need to be incentivized to do that thing. Um, Maybe it's an extrinsic thing. Oh, I'm going to get paid. Yeah. Or maybe it's an intrinsic thing. Oh, I'm going to feel good after I do this. Uh, but you need to have that. Uh, and then because, and then the next step is just kind of learning and yeah. then being able to kind of focus and kind of think through problems and kind of uh, remember. And yeah, just kind of. Yeah. So I could be wrong, but this, what's your advice on this? It's like most like coding academies or boot camps for kids be, or anyone, or, you know, they'll, they'll tell a brand new developer, like, you know, or someone wants to learn code, like learn HTML, CSS, and C++ first, right? Or Java first. So they do that, so just like jump straight into the Python or something like that. Mm -hmm. What do you think they should do? Well, I think the software engineering kind of industry is very broad. I think they are tackling what is most um, probable that is going to give you a job right after this coding academy ends. And the more jobs, I mean, there's a ton of web development jobs out there. And now there's a ton of also kind of data science jobs out there. So they're going to teach you Python for the data development or for the data science. They're going to teach you HTML for your web development. Um, so I think for them, it's just kind of, it's, it's, not, it's not like, how can we create uh, the most well-rounded, amazing software engineer? It's like, what can we teach you right now that's going to get you a job yeah. tomorrow? That's it. To, you know, say, hey, this is the reason we, you paid $57,000 for the 60 course. We're going to get you a job record. Right yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think their decision making around their curriculum. Yes, it is rounded. Well, I cannot speak for any coding academy, but it, this is what I think. Um, it is mostly it's a business. It's a business. And, and yes, you're improving someone's life, but at the end of the day, you're, you got to pay the bills. Right? You have to pay the bills and uh, the way to improve their life is to get them a job. Mm -hmm. So how are you, how are you most likely to get them a job? Well, you teach them the skills that are on demand. So, so next talk about your love of teaching and what you're doing. I think it's called the dub developers. Oh yeah. Talk about that real fast. Yeah. So I think it, mostly it started when I was in university, I was, uh, I co-founded a computer club. And I was very much passionate about um, sharing and just kind of what, yeah, just kind of sharing. And I created uh, with some friends, the computer club, which was amazing. And then that's where I learned that, hey, like sitting down with people, it takes a long time uh, when they have an issue with their code, 
And there's no, and when we launched this, we came with like 40, 50 people and we were doing workshops and all that stuff. And I said, well, what if I create a software that just basically gives you the problem and then anybody can solve it. And the, the software will tell you if it's right or if it's not um, yet there. And so that was the beginning of what uh, a software that I uh, created called Teddy, which is actually still, I don't know if we're showing this. This is it. Okay. So this is the software that I created when it was I was in university. And it's basically uh, an online judge and it helps you. It has a bunch of problems. And then people just basically go through the problems and create a, um, a solution. So here's a problem just says add two numbers. And then you here and then submit the solution. And anyways, very, very much passionate about uh, computer science education. And then when I went into my master's, I was looking for places where I could do the same. And I found this developers uh, club that was teaching uh, web development skills to other students. And so I just offered myself as an instructor. Yeah, but how, how, was, how many hours per week do you spend on this? Well, uh, doing my master's. So you're not doing it right now? I am not doing it okay. because it's mostly students. It's okay. students instructing students. Okay. So when I was a student, I was able to participate and then I graduated, but it was uh, maybe two hours per week. Okay. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're a startup founder now, you have your own startup, but yet you got your master's in entrepreneurship at the University of Washington, right? Yes. Some people would say like, it's like an oxymoron to go to school to learn entrepreneurship, right? Yes. Like, what do you, did you actually, what do you actually get out of the, the, this master's degree? That yeah. You out? Before I did the master's in science and entrepreneurship, I did an MBA. And the MBA, I went into the MBA. It was even worse, some people would say, to go into an MBA too, because if you want to do entrepreneurship. But nonetheless, I was uh, I was very intrigued in this MBA because it was all about leadership. It was an, uh, focused on leadership. And prior to entering this MBA, I had already founded a nonprofit. And the challenges, my biggest challenges, were not in the technical space, were not in the project management space, we're in the people space. And I said, well, uh, leading people is really hard. Convincing people to go into a, uh, have a, like, let's say we all have a vision. We all want to go in the same direction, but we all have very different opinions on how to get there. And that's really, really challenging. And that's why I, I was attracted to the MBA in the first place. And when the MBA finished, I, I was just like incomplete. Like, you know, it was just like, this is amazing. Was that you're incomplete or you're just a glutton for punishment? Uh, what's that? A glutton for punishment. Uh, Got one master's, let me go get another one. No, 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 <laughs> not at all, not at all. Uh, I, I knew from the second, like many years ago, I knew that I wanted to do uh, startups and I didn't call it startups. I just kind of said my own business. Uh, and I knew that what I had seen in that MBA was really, really good in terms of corporate uh, corporations, large corporations and leadership, That which is what I got in there for, which is amazing. But I was still lacking all the kind of resources for launching a business from scratch. So I looked and I said, well, what, what else can I do? And I, in the, in the meantime, I, I sort of started another startup, which is not public uh, anywhere. It's called WeGo, and it was all about um, compostable commerce or like headless commerce. So basically, um, it's a tech startup, right? So I was doing this work, and I said, like many tech founders think, um, this is an amazing idea, and I'm going to create it, and people are going to realize that this is an amazing idea, and everybody's going to come, and we're everybody is going to be happy. But that didn't happen. Uh, nobody, the moment when we closed doors for that startup, uh, nobody cared. Absolutely nobody. Because I had spent very, very little to begin with. I was so focused on the technology, uh, very, very focused on the coding, on the infrastructure. It was amazing. Like, it was really, really, really something special for me. As, as it was my previous startup, like, the technology aspect is is something that really fascinates me but I wasn't really running a business. It was like a side project. So with that experience, um, 
I said, okay, where, what, uh, what other options do I have uh, for learning? Okay, I know a little bit more about leadership, but I still need fundamental business skills for starting. And that's what this master's was. Uh, and in, during the interviews, yes, they tell me there's going to be a lot of overlap between your MBA and this, this program, because it's essentially an MBA Focus doesn't matter, you know, it's it's quite different from my perspective because I already went through an MBA and I already know that I didn't get what I needed uh, for this. So I still want to do it. And and then I went ahead and did it and everything changed. Like I met so many amazing people, like the startup ecosystem at UW is mind blowing. It really, really changed everything. And it really taught me that even though we were seeing the same things in finance, in marketing, in product management, like all the projects are your own startup. So you immediately put it to practice. And that was fascinating because it's different than just kind of learning something in theory and then just kind of translating, how does this look in your own startup? And there's like so many business competitions. There's so many clubs by students uh, to help you either pitch or just hackathons that help you build products. And the networking was also phenomenal. Uh, a lot of the instructors were like either investors or, or they know critical aspects of um, entrepreneurship. And it was just like fascinating. And it was just sort of inspiring to see. And everybody around you is doing the exact same thing. It is very, very different. So from my MBA, I probably was the one, no, either the only one, my class was very small, like 20. Um, but I was the only one like really, really was ready to jump into startups. But over here, everybody's doing the same thing. And that's kind of different. And the classes were like also very, very meaningful. The things that I still use to this day. Um, so throughout the MBA and the masters, I, I try to kind of save all the, like all the worksheets, all the, all the materials, because right now it's not used, but it will be used at some point. And so, I bring that. So for instance, when I was doing interview, when, when people were interviewing for the uh, position, uh, deathmatch, they surprised me asking me, what's the culture at deathmatch? I was like, oh, I don't know. Uh, and I just kind of answered something, but it really got me thinking, what is the culture at match? And so I went back into all those kind of kind of work I was given both in the MBA and in the master's of science. And it gave me a, it gives you a very good framework. It's you're not starting from scratch, so I would say it was it was really good. Okay, so a couple of questions like, is there a set number in the entrepreneurship program each year? Like only ten people get in or twenty people get in? The classes are around twenty five to thirty. Okay, um, yeah. And it's a one year program. It is a one year program. At the at the one year pro program, like what? I would say it's the minority. Um, that people learn is not for them or what are the cases of being? There's many reasons. Yeah, I would say, I personally think that uh, there's like, I want to be an entrepreneur and there's the, I want to, I have this idea. Yeah. And so when you have just one idea and then we all know that most ideas are not business, um, viable businesses. So when you realize you only care about this one idea, but if you really cared about the entrepreneurial journey, those are the people that continue for too long, maybe, but like, the <laughs> no, definitely. Yeah. We'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, that's a good case. Like, um, like on one hand, you have people in the startup community say, you know, within nine days, you don't have like part of market fit MVP, a million dollars, MOR, like, mm -hmm. you know, what are you doing? Quit. Right. Other hand, people say, well, I don't care if you spent 10 years, you have no product, keep on going. Right. Yes. It has to be somewhere in between. I think. Right. Absolutely. Um, Another great thing about being in the Masters of Science and Entrepreneurship, again, is the ecosystem, one of those uh, being the startup hall space. That's another place where there's a ton of um, kind of founders doing the same thing that you are. And you see people that have been doing this for a very long time. Some people that are just kind of, oh, I had this idea. Let me try it. And so um, I don't think there's a way or like a path, a set path to being an entrepreneur. There's definitely best practices, uh, but I think you, you are on your own journey and maybe you enjoy the, 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 the process and maybe it's going to take longer for you. I was just thinking about this the other day. Um, 
it's it's been a year and a half since Deathmatch started, and I really I enjoy a ton of the aspects of creating the company. If I were, on the other hand, obsessed with the outcome, would it have been taking me that long? Because I don't care about the price. Like, just take the shortcut, do this thing. Let's get to 100 customers. Yeah. Whereas another person might say, oh, let's think really hard about how we're going to hire and let's do this architecture. The long-term diagram. implications of yeah. decisions. And so be, why? Because you enjoy that um, maybe, or because you that's the way that you were being taught how to do something. So um, as, as many things, it's very complicated, but it is a combination of a sense of urgency and enjoying the process. I think those are the yeah. There's many ways success. Like what works for you might not work for me. Might not work for anyone else. Absolutely. You know. Yeah. Uh, next, let's talk about hiring. Right. So I want to when you I said I want you meetings. Right. You have a pretty diverse team. Right. Yeah. I mean, pretty diverse. Right. Having said that, some are probably see that same group of people say you're not diverse. Right. Because diverse means different things. Different things. Correct. Um, like I believe diverse hiring is important, but you should always hire the best person. Like like some like I believe hire the best person. You find the best person across all different demographics. Right. I mean, it's about the same. <laughs> So what was your process of hiring, you know, and doing that and bring on and nothing too, like people will say, like, first, like talk about leadership, like you have to convince someone like basically work for free or like, you know, less money than somewhere else. You got to start off, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, that's not easy to do. And then like I always say, like diverse hiring is, is good, but like, it's not easy, right? You, you have to get like close. You can't say I'm going to hire an Asian female from Vietnam, right? Yeah. First, they have to want to work for you, you know? Yeah. You know, and if first they, you know, have to do the job, right? So can you talk about, like, break that down a little bit? Absolutely. And I'm, uh, I'm going to start with something that happened to me that kind of formed a lot of my, this. well, I don't know if it formed it, but, like, I still remember it. So uh, I had already stepped down from being the CEO at Omega Up, which is a nonprofit. And I felt that I had some experience in my hands uh, being a CEO. So I went to a, a, an incubator that was incubating nothing but uh, nonprofits in Seattle. And I met with the, with this guy and with, they were hosting a round table because they were looking for CEOs. And I came th to, the, to the table thinking that I had a shot at running one of the businesses. And the one of, at some point, this person that was kind of the owner of the incubator told us, uh, I'm only going to hire a woman for this thing. I don't care if I get sued. I don't care. No, no, no. I'm only going to hire a woman for this CEO role. And I thought about it. And I, another very interesting thing happened there. Uh, when the meeting finished, uh, somebody, we we were offered... Uh, mugs for coffee and then everybody uh left the office i left my mug in the in, in the table uh, when, whereas other people kind of took their mug and took to, to the kitchen and so I, I learned a lot about in that meeting uh, and then i was thinking i was as on my way home i was reflecting about that uh what that felt that i thought i had experience in being a ceo i thought i had experience into education, nonprofit, like it seemed like a good fit. And yet uh, this person is saying, no, I'm not going to hire you because you're not a woman. And, and I said, okay, I mean, you want to diversify your team or, may, or maybe it makes sense for, for um, this person to be a female. Uh, but it, re it, it, re it was, that's something that I had never experienced, never, ever. And it just led me to think that, well, this is something that happens to other people all the time, all the time. Maybe they're blunt like that. Maybe they're not so blunt. Um, but it really kind of, I was just like surprised that why are you not even considering me? Like, what if I have something to show? What if I um, actually have some experience? It's like that I cannot control. That kind of... Um, but something that happened to me. Um, I didn't get the job. But <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get the job. Um, and then and then I started doing my own startups. At, at that point, I had already been at Omega Up and I had I'd done a bunch of hiring uh, at a nonprofit, which is tough because um, you have to convince them to do something for very, very cheap and meaningful in economical sense. 
it is just you're just going to change someone's life. So anyways, that, that was tough. Uh, but I do remember one time, uh, I, I, again, when I was doing in my MBA, I went to a computer club, the ACM computer club at UW Bothell. And it was, that was amazing because I was always trying to get myself into in front of like computer clubs. I like them. And I went to this pizza party and there was this uh, young lady there and she was kind of just with her, with a friend, just kind of talking about stuff. And I started pitching. Well, I didn't think, what did I say? I said something like, uh, I want you to work for me or something like that. Uh, I, I want to, I want to, I want to bring you into this project. She's like, yeah, okay, but reluctant. And then when we started working on this thing, I don't think she had experience like uh, with software engineering. And then we spent an evening, like four or five hours, no, like four hours, just uh, walking through the process of creating a pull request. This is how you do it. This is how you make the change. Creating a pull request is your way of telling the team that you're done with this change and that you want to contribute it to the main base of the code. And that's how you do it. So now that you've done it, I want you to take this other bug and fix it and then create a pull request. And tomorrow or like the next day, you tell me when you're done. And then I turn off my computer. And then the, the, I went to sleep because it was late. And then I, I woke up and then I opened my computer. And the first thing I see is a pull request from her. And she got spent, she got continued going. And then she fixed the bug. And she didn't only fix the bug, she fixed it in other places where that, that thing was uh, also this happened. Like a... it... Wow, this is amazing. This is great. This is fantastic. And she uh, developed most of that startup that I was uh, working on that, that time. Yeah. So I don't know, uh, but I remember that very vividly because I said, well, people, there's really good people out there that really want to do things and that really care and that really want to kind of, this is just kind of for them. Yeah. Uh, so how do you find them? How do you, and that's kind of the, one of, one of the big aspects of DevMatch, uh, which leads me to a very similar experience with the newest, which you, who you met, uh, software engineering, the team. Uh, we use DevMatch for hiring her um, and she's a freshman. I didn't know she was a freshman. I didn't, honestly, I didn't really go in depth with the resumes. Uh, I just gave them the death match assessment. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of resumes either, to be honest with you. And we started doing the final rounds of interviews. And then I was kind of certain who I was going to hire. And then I think this engineer was the, first, the last one. Um, and she fixes the code in front of me, blah, blah, blah. And then starts using keyboard shortcuts that I didn't even know on VS Code. Uh -huh. And I was like, wait, wait, how did you do that? Yeah. And I was like, boom, immediately. And then we were uh, having a lunch with the team. And then she, somebody asked her, "Where? what year are you in? And she's like, oh, I'm a freshman. You're like, you're my brother. Like... And then I went and looked at the resume and she had no prior experience yeah. in software engineering. Uh -huh. And so I guess my point is that even though everything I do uh, or I ended up doing in software, like in my career, kind of helps uh, diversity and inclusion and just kind of giving opportunity to people, I don't obsess about it mm -hmm. when, yeah. when, when I'm doing it. Um, I just create a process that is uh, fair. And so far, it's been almost automatic yeah. that the diversity is coming into the team. Yeah, I agree with you. That's a good story. Um, talk about your nonprofit Omega Up. That's not going on anymore, right? It is going on. Oh, still going yeah, on. Yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. that. Omega Up is, is um, this is Omega Up. Um, it all started with that original online judge that I created a long time ago. Because of this, I was uh, contacted by uh, two now friends about creating the same thing, but for Mexico. And that sounded great because we all use, we all did competitive uh, competitions using very archaic software that was very, very old and blah, blah, blah. And we all wanted to run computer clubs in our schools, computer competitions, uh, coding competitions and all that stuff. So we just, uh, so we launched into creating Omega Up. And Omega Up is just basically what I described the other day, which is a platform that has a ton of problems 
And it allows people to select a problem and then just kind of solve it. And then the, the software, the judge kind of tells you what is the, uh, if it's correct or not. And this is something you, you built? Yes, yes, with, with them. Um, and so we had, we had very, very in, insanely talented people uh, as part of the Omega team. And at some point, we all got hired. Uh, well, when we started, it was just the three of us. And then we all got hired by Microsoft at the, at the same time, pretty much. So we all came to, the, to Redmond to start working full time. And then we realized, hey, it's a, long, it's a lot of work to have your own stuff, uh, your own full-time employment, plus doing this Omega Up thing. And so we decided to create a nonprofit. And so that is the Omega Up um, nonprofit that we have that we see here. And the nonprofit is mostly about the non-technical aspects of teaching computer and science. Uh, so maybe um, bringing a mentor to a class, bringing uh, that sense sense of um, Com competition to to the classroom and then omega up started getting a lot of kind of attention and then it went into middle school and then it went to, into elementary and i went to mexico to meet with the uh, professors are telling me alan you have no idea what this is i mean elementary that would rather stay inside during recess solving problems for for Omega up instead of going out there. So that that was that was kind of it's still going what, on. What do you see the future of this being? Where well, do you see I, this going? I think the idea, one of the biggest ideas that we had for Omega Up when I was there is that right now large tech companies source talent from Latin America. Okay. Them, they fly, they go out there, do the interviews, and then bring them, pay them. Uh, moving expenses and they treat you very well and they give you this massive salary and all that stuff because it's cheaper it's cheaper to do that than to say put headquarters on a latin american country so we were saying because the the selected talent was not that much the people that you wanted to bring so what we were saying what if we provide the infrastructure so that there's a lot of opportunities and education and all those things in Latin America, that there's so much talent that it would be cheaper for a US company to go and put an office. And so you don't have to bring that talent all the way to over here, but to open an office in Latin America and have the student, well, the, the population work there and live there and spend there. So. That to me is kind of one of the biggest um, things uh, that we could ever achieve with Omega. Okay. Um, what's your take on um, hackathons? Hackathons are great. Uh, I think they're a fantastic way of um, just kind of having fun um, and just kind of meeting people and getting to um, build something. Sometimes you're always wanted to learn Python or you always wanted to do, do something with uh, AI, but you never really quite find the time. So hackathons are a perfect way for us to um, basically uh, uh, kind of exercise that or experiment and all that stuff. Well, hackathons is supposed to work like, you know, maybe you have four people and you already know each other. You go to a hackathon. It's supposed to be like more like, you go hackathon by yourself, meet four different people you never met before, and then do the hackathon. Is it a preferred way? Or does that mean? No, 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 no. A hackathon is just like a party. It's just, there's no way, there's no one way of doing it. Um, so you can just basically do it like you said, form your teams prior, and then there's a lot of structure, and then you come in and you present to the judges and all that stuff. Or you can just say, hey, there's pizza. There's a theme. Come on in and do it yourself, do it with a team, do it whatever. And then there's there's no right way. We're actually hosting a hackathon this Friday, this coming Friday. Okay. Uh, and, and we just give pizza, that's it. Yeah. So talk about the importance of having a good designer on your team. Mm -hmm. Like I think a lot of developers they build, they, they don't care about the, how it looks. Yeah. But how it looks is important, right? Very important. So can you talk about the points of that?
I think a piece of software is useless. It's, it's a wasted effort if it's not used. I know that. Two of my previous startups, well, my, my first two startups uh, that were like 100% technical aspects uh, didn't really achieve anything. They died. And so why did they, why does nobody know about them? Because they don't get used. They didn't get used. And the interface, or should I say the user experience is such a big block to allowing somebody to use something. So even if you have the most amazing piece of software and it solves a very critical problem and all that stuff, if somebody does not know how to use it or cannot use it, even if they want to, it's just kind of, um, it's impossible for yeah, them to use I, it. I think a lot of tech people with this, they get this confused. Like, I think a lot of tech people, like my thing is like, just because it's a good experience, user experience, user experience for you doesn't mean it's a good user experience for everyone else, right? You're not building I, necessarily yeah. for yourself. I think a lot of people get that messed yeah, up. Yeah, you're not building. And this, I, I remember this uh, from somebody. Um, he was saying, oh, I wish we were working on Windows, on Windows, the operating system. And he was saying, oh, I wish Windows did this, did that. And and then he said, well, if, if I were to build Windows the way I want it, uh, nobody would buy it yeah. uh, because he's just not the target audience uh, for that particular thing. And so, well, he is, but like <laughs> um, it's it targets so much, so many other individuals, right? So I think that's critical. And that is something that I emphasize. And we, and you saw this during the meeting that I invited you to Deathmatch. Uh, we talked a lot about the ICP, Ideal Customer Profile. And everything, absolutely every single thing we do starts or should start with the ideal customer profile. Who is this person? How much time do they spend on the computer? Like, where are they? Where do they hang out? What are their key points? What are their um, um, objectives? What are their common objections? All those things. Anyways, all this to say that that person should be able to use the software. And that's where users user experience and design come in. And the other thing that I, I learned with the designer that we have right now at Deathmatch, uh, the difference and the true difference between user, well, my, as I understand the difference between user experience, user interfaces and graphic design. So graphic design is just taking somebody's vision and creating some sort of visual elements that are beautiful and that really transmit the things that you want to say. And when we're on with meetings with him, we talk about um, the meaning of the colors, like the the the. the yeah, you're right. Like I tell story before, like when I was first trying to design my website and stuff, I had a designer, and like I want blue. He's like what blue you want? <laughs> and they laid out all these number of blues. Like what the fuck is going on here right now? Right? right? Yeah. When, when, like blue is blue, right? No, no, blue is not blue. If you're designing BC, oh and it's gosh. like I was like, "What in the world is happening right now?" It's so big. It's it's a and and Daniel Daniel's his name. He's um uh, he goes very deep into this stuff. Um, uh, that's why we started creating a brand design book. And we're a pre seed company. Like who? What pre seed company? Yeah, it's important to have though. But I personally feel it's important mm -hmm. and. It helps him do his job. It helps me kind of bring all these ideas together such that I can, because sometimes I have an, uh, like a vision of what we want to do, what I want to do, but it, how do you explain that? Yeah. And sometimes I just get frustrated and I just say, you know what, just this, this is the blue. This is the that we need. Boom. That's it. Instead of saying, what that is calm. Yeah. And they make the decision. And then now they have more data points. And so for us in particular, it's very important because when you are about to jump into an interview, you're very stressed. You're very, very stressed. Yeah. You, you have one hour to do this thing. You know that you're going to be pushed. You know that uh, you, this is a job you want. So your stress levels are very high. When you come into the, the platform, is a glitch or the, a very archaic old UI that doesn't really, like you don't know how to do it, 
boom, your, your chances of demonstrating your knowledge, your skills go down. Not because you don't know, because the tool that you're using to demonstrate the knowledge is not good. And so the whole point of deathmatch is that we allow you to demonstrate your, your skills and knowledge and experience through real life simulations, right? That's the whole point. It's just like, a, it's a vessel that trans, like it tells this person, it tells the other person, this person can do this thing. But if in the process of doing that, we're presenting you with a broken UI or something <laughs> that is, your stress levels go up. So that's why I think that uh, UX is usually very, very, it's very important. But for us, it's like massively important because uh, it's, it's it, everything is in this moment. You using this tool to demonstrate what you know. So, um, yeah. So talk about this, right? This is like, in like ex extremes on both sides, right? So on one side, you always have a tech founder, right? And that all they do is product, 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 and they never like do any marketing, right? Mm -hmm. On the other side, you have a not tech founder who doesn't have a code. Yeah. So he's been on the time marketing, 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 had nothing to sell, right? How, work your relations on both those people, like kind of come in the middle, so to speak. It's really tough. Uh, the easiest way that I can think of is just get different people. Uh, just uh, go find a co-founder that really um, understands what is being done, uh, maybe because they are trying to do it as well. Um, and then just now having said that, I haven't done that because it's really tough uh, for me at least to... I care so much and so deeply about this. And I know about people that I would love to bring in, but I just don't feel that we're ready yet. Um, and that has slightly changed. And again, that sense of urgency. Um, and, and for me, it was when ChatGPT started becoming a, a massive thing. I always wanted to bring some people that I know from my past that I would be very good at product when I know I'm uh, good at, I don't know, something else. Um, but I always waited for the right, right moment. ChatGPT coming into the picture, I said, now is the time, like right now is, this is not gonna happen again, you know? And I remember I read this, I don't know if it's true or not, but like uh, when Bill Gates, uh, I think he was in school and then Paul Allen, I think, uh, grab the magazine with the DIY computer that was being distributed at that time. He went to him and said, happening without us right now. Like this revolution is happening right now and we're not part of it. Like what? Well, like, we need to be part of it. So I feel kind of similar. Like I've been wanting to do this for so long and maybe because I enjoy the process so much that it's taken me a long time. Um, but that sense of urgency is finally making me go to people that I always wanted to bring and tell them, I need you, I want you. And what are we, like, this is gonna happen with you or, or with, with us or without us. Like somebody's gonna create this platform. And to my surprise, some say, yes, yeah, this is amazing. Uh, let's, let's do something. So that's how I try to kind of find people that, do things slightly different uh, than what I do. And, and the other thing is that when I collaborate with somebody that is incredibly smart and sometimes I disagree with them, sometimes I really disagree with them, like a lot, like we very professional, but a lot. I'm going into like fist fights yeah. with people. Um, just one time though, but, <laughs> but other times and that was a very long time ago, but like we, we be, but that's great because we, that just means that both really, really, really care about the thing being discussed. Right. And so we move, we move on and then I reflect on what happened. And those were the moments where I learned the most. It was not by hiring somebody that is just going to tell me, oh yeah, you're great. All that, that stuff. Uh, it's mostly by hiring or not, or working with somebody that is just kind of going to challenge you. Um, so, yeah. And you, you have a board of advisors? I do. I have two advisors right Talk now. Talk about like, like multifaceted, like, like how do you recruit them? How do you convince them to come on board? And what's the benefits of having a board of advisors? Well, um, again, the first one I met through the UW uh, startup community, we were a part of a program called iCorps 
that teaches you uh, customer development. And he was just there to listen to our presentation. And I just felt that he sort of, he really understood what we were doing. And I just asked for another meeting. And then he kind of went over all of his, um, kind of his background, how he can help. And I think the most important thing that really told me that, okay, this guy needs to be an advisor is uh, I was really afraid. I was really scared uh, during the meeting, the one of the initial meetings. Um, I felt like I was presenting to, like he was asking me like all these very, very tough questions. Why are you doing this? Why are you not doing this? Like, who's your customer? Like, well, it sounds very obvious right now, but like, you're just this attempt at a business and then somebody comes in and just asks you all these questions like boom, 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 boom. And I, and I felt like this is the right pressure that I need right now. It's going to give me a lot of sense of urgency instead of just like, oh, I have this vision of something that needs to happen and I'm going to make it there somehow. No, I need somebody to ask me all the basic fundamental questions and it's just kind of waiting for the answer. And if I say something that doesn't make sense, they're going to tell me. So that's when I uh, decided, okay, this person, I think they they really understand what we're doing and they're make, they, making me think that was the first advisor that we got. Like, how do you utilize that? Like you do weekly meetings with them, monthly meetings? I used to work? have monthly, no, uh, weekly meetings, I think. Uh, that, was, that, that was the advisor number one. Advisor number two is an actual recruiter. I mean, we do a ton of like, we're not a recruiting company, but everything we do right now is just kind of around recruiting. We're just a tool inside the recruiting pipeline. Um, and this guy was an actual recruiter that actually taught us how to recruiters think about stuff. And yes, I did set up meetings every week with them. Just, I would go ahead and present to them. And then I also realized that I needed more time to present more meaningful things. Mm -hmm. So right now we're just meeting on a as needed basis. Okay. Um, next talk about the thing is called the Jones Foster Accelerator. Yes. Is that something like y'all like just completed or what is that? We can, the Johns Foster uh, Accelerator is um, is an accelerator um, by the um, Foster School of Business. And they give you six advisors and over the long, over the, it's I think six months, six months or a year. I don't know, um, but it's it's around that. It's a, it's a long thing. I think it's six months. And over the course of six months, you meet with them, you set up your objectives. This is what I want to achieve. You work your objectives with these with the advisors who are coming from many different areas. Maybe somebody, we had an attorney, somebody that was um, into software and many, many different things, areas. And so we come together, we create the objectives and then we work towards those objectives. And at the very end, you present to the entire group and you're doing this alongside other five startups. And then at the end you present, and if you, if you accomplish most of your objectives or to their kind of verdict, uh, they decide that yes, you worked towards your objectives, whether you actually completed every single one of them or not, uh, then you get a, a grant, okay. 25,000. Okay. And do you have to give any equity for this? No, Okay. no, which is great. So you talked about this summer already, but can you talk more about the UW startup ecosystem? Yeah. So the first time I, um, I mean, it's really, really broad. There's there's classes. There's, of course, the Master's of Science in Entrepreneurship. There's the Berg Center for Entrepreneurship. And then outside of that, there's so many kind of clubs, like student-led efforts to, that help entrepreneurship. And no, no, no peer pressure. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and there's also one of the biggest ones, uh, it's a class, um, that is, uh, I think when I was originally, actually this class was what re was 40% of why I applied to the masters of science and entrepreneurship. And it's not even in the curriculum. It's a called, uh, called startup entrepreneurship. Uh, and it's taught by, uh, Greg Gottsman and Ed Latsowska. Um, and they both, they mix the class with MBAs, computer science, and 
I always forget this acronym, HDCI, Human Centered Design. Yeah, I know you're talking about. I know yeah. the letter who runs it. Yeah, I know you're talking about. Yeah. I think it's HDCI, something like that. And so they build teams of three, uh, I'm sorry, of the three uh, kind of categories. And then they, of course, kind of build a startup. So that was amazing because um, uh, Greg Gottsman's a very famous uh, entrepreneur. He was the co founder or founder of Rover. Um, I mean, Madrona, so many long, long, um, long career. And right now he runs Pioneer Square Labs. Okay. All right. And Ed Lasowska um, is a very distinguished computer scientist. And the thing that I remember the most is that he was on the, so in computer, in computer science, there's this very, very, very important award called the Turing Award. Okay. And uh, it, it is kind of the Nobel Prize of computer science. And he was in the committee for some years uh, determining who gets to get that award. Uh, and an incredibly kind of human and just kind of down to earth and just kind of easy to talk to. And anyways, um, classes like that, um, where you bring, and one of the, actually one of the, um, the guest speakers was Andy Jassy, the CEO okay. of Amazon. Okay. So that caliber of um, uh, guests we had. Um, so there, there was that, uh, there were the, all the startup competitions, um, where I met a ton of teammates. There was, of course, the the Masters, the Johns Foster, the Dempsey Startup Competition. I mean, it's just all over the place. Startup Hall. How many years have you been involved with the UW startup scene? I mean, since I started there. Uh, when, even though my MBA was at uh, University of Washington Bothell, um, I didn't really feel part of the university. Mm -hmm. um, commun Number one, the classes where in a, it, they were not on campus. They were in a separate um, facility that they have. And it was just like um, classroom in the middle of a business campus. So that's it. Uh, but when I went into the Seattle campus, when I started the Masters of Science and Entrepreneur, that was completely different. Like you're like it's, more of a community, so to speak. It, it is entirely a community. And it was also full time. On my MBA, I was going in the evenings. Yeah, that's a big difference. It is a massive difference. So even though I was already kind of sort of part of the UW community, full time to university, like you're immersing yourself into this thing, full time. Like you're an extra student versus absolutely. You know. That's definitely how it, how it felt. Yeah. So next, talk about um. I have this question. Like from your point of view, how does the UW startup scene system integrate with the total overall Seattle startup scene? There's a a good chunk of um. Con connections being made. And so what I will say is that, for instance, uh, there is a fund, not a fund, uh, a VC called PAC Ventures that is exclusively focused on startups that have a tie to it. It doesn't, you don't have, you don't have to be a student. Uh, maybe you're a professor or in some ways tied to UW. And so by virtue of having all these events, so Dempsey Startup Competition and Johns Foster and all that stuff, those things need mentors and they need judges so that they bring people from the industry. And that is how I met a ton. I mean, that's how I met my one of my advisors. Uh, a bunch of investors I've spoken to are just people that these um, programs bring and then introduce us to. So for instance, upcoming, we have... Um, um, uh, investor roundtable where they're going to pick a bunch of startups and then they're going to bring a bunch of um, investors and then they're just going to talk. Are you, are you talking about the speed dating thing? Yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's going to happen sometime soon. Yeah, yeah, I applauded that. So hopefully, I, I didn't know it was going to be this big deal. Uh, yeah. I, I would have. I got an email from, from um, I think Sarah Sudo said like 80 yeah. startups apply for 30 spots. So yeah, we'll see. Exactly. Um, and you recently pitched at Founders Live, correct? I did. So talk about, we're talking about founders live a minute, but talk about the points of putting yourself out there as a founder, like putting your idea out in the public and getting it like, I won't say destroy, but uh, getting like maybe negative feedback on your idea, so to speak, how you need to put yourself out there. Yeah. Um, it's very typical um, to go out there and then just kind of mm, explain your idea. Sometimes see that they're like, 
Oh, that's great. When in reality, I absolutely know that they're like, no, this is never going to happen. Or like, you're not the right person or like something like that. Yeah, as a founder, you definitely got to learn how to, you know, say what somebody's really saying, right? Yeah. You know, it's, oh, this is the best idea ever, you know? And But you, but you can know, you just can tell, like, they're saying, like, yeah, this shit's all fucked up. Get on my face. <laughs> like, never going to I'll, I'll never give no money. Like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. And that's tough. Uh, just so much rejection, whether it's direct or not. I've had some people just straight up tell me, no, this is, like, in the first, like, minute of the conversation is like no i've seen this before like you haven't even heard me say half of making your decision and it's tough yeah but a quick no is always better than a delayed maybe right that is true that yeah. is uh in some ways uh in some cases so if the person knows how to give you feedback then yes that is really good but i guess the other part that is really good is that it helps you like you said put you putting yourself out there and then just kind of helping, um, getting over the anxiety of being in front of yeah. people. And the other thing I learned is that is really it was really useful for my team. Yeah, for them to see because even I mean we spend we work on a daily basis, mm -hmm. and there's still stuff that they learned when I was pitching. I know you know I never <laughs> thought about it like that. That's 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 actually a good point. Yeah. Not only that, they see what people say about what you're doing, right? So they're like, oh man, they said this, they said that. We never thought about that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a very good point. And and it was it, they keep talking about this uh, event, uh, my team, um, because they had a good time. They got they got together. They spoke with each other. Yeah. And and they got to see what I what is it that we're all constructing? Because if they don't know what we're building, then like okay, you're just paying me so that I can change the color of this yeah. thing. What does it really matter? You Why? Know? Why? Okay. So th that means that they're not going to be incentivized to go and really fix the thing. You know, they're just doing something because I, because it was in the, in the, in the backlog. Yeah. So first cheers. Oh, cheers. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, so talk about, so Final, those of you don't know Founders Live, Founders Live, Started in Seattle, like the 2016, it's feature, first feature Friday. And Nick Hughes, the CEO, expanded like across the world, right? So across mm -hmm. the world, people do like pitch competitions. The difference I heard about is like, it's 99 seconds. Yeah. And that shit is not easy, right? Like no. talk about the difficulty, or maybe it was easy for you, like do your pitch, your whole company's everything in 99 seconds. Mm -hmm. Um, As you say, it was, it was definitely difficult. Here's where I really worked together with the designer, with Daniel. Um, and... This I learned during during the Dempsey startup competition, which is kind of practice. It's just so obvious, right? Practicing, but like really, really practice, really recording yourself. So for the Dempsey the startup competitor, I needed to pitch. It was not 99 seconds. But what I would do is I collected a group of people, people that I admired and that I respected. And I recorded my pitch every single night. I would work on it all day. And then at the evening, I would record it. And then I would send it to them for feedback. And I use the, I, we use this tool called Loom. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Loom yeah. lets yeah. you add comments right yeah. there. And then uh, they, they would add, and then I would spend all day next day. They just kind of it again. And I did that for like a week and a half or two weeks before the event. And that really energized everybody involved in this project. It energized me and energized the the advisors and i did that again and at the end of that experience uh i didn't win we didn't win the dempsey startup competition uh but at the end one of the advisors when he wasn't even a real adv a, a proper advisor to the startup he was just something that i really respected and he emailed saying hey this thing that you're doing you're just putting yourself out there just kind of you have earned my respect. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was just kind of, wow. That's a win right there. That is amazing. And another person, another one of our mentors said, I would never do this. I could never do this. So you, I commend you for doing something like this. And I took that approach to uh, John's Foster and just kind of recording myself, um, not John's Foster, to the Founders Live. And I just kind of recorded myself over and over again. And just kind of compressing everything kind of forces you to think, what are we doing? Like, yeah. what is the one core thing? Mm -hmm. This is one of the things that I learned in that class from Greg and Ed. What is the one thing 
the absolute one thing that you're better at than absolutely anybody else in the world today? Just one. What is it? That's a very good thing. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great point. And so you, you need to know what that is for your startup. What is, what is the one thing that you are going to be uh, the best in the world at? And go all in just push you. And so I think it, it really helped us. Um, it really, it also helped me in that presentation. I, I was very nervous um, because I oftentimes overdo stuff. <laughs> and I remember we, we got this coach, uh, Melissa. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Melissa Reese, I think. Yes. Yes. She's great. And she was very, very pleased with the work that we had done uh, for that presentation. And I, that made me foot. And then I went ahead and presented it. And we didn't win again. And I emailed Melissa and I said, we didn't win. What do you think we, we should be doing? And she told me that basically it's not like, it's not random, but you should not kind of trust like, People vote for the slight less, for, for the most small reasons. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe they were wearing a nice shirt or, yeah. or something. Or like I saw my neighbor and they were voting for this startup. So I did it as well. Yeah. And to just kind of let it go. I know that I was obsessing about it, but she just kind of let it go and just kind of keep it. So yeah. that was, it, was, it was a very nice uh, event. But more, more than any, if I can take one thing out of that, it was what it did for the team. So one thing I like about Founders Live is that you, it, it's not a bunch of judge, two, two, three judges. Like, yeah. it's the crowd voting. And not right. only that, the crowd gets to ask the questions, right? So when I would pitch, like last year, like you have to be ready for any type of question, yeah. right? Like you just can't, you like, if you have three judges, you kind of research on LinkedIn, like this guy is a tech guy. You might probably ask me a tech question marking. Yeah, like, it all makes sense, but like sometimes I'm out of left field, right? So you got to be prepared to answer everything. Absolutely. Um, you have to be very good at... Uh... It's almost like acting mm. or it's almost like a thing. I mean, it's a performance, right? It is a performance. So I remember I was going, I was at a, this presentation and they were asking questions via the chat. It was a webinar or something like that. And somebody asked the question via chat. But one of the organizers asked the, the, the person presenting, hey, the question is blah, blah, blah. And the presenter was like, no, I don't understand it. Do you think they mean this or, or do they mean this other thing? We don't know. Like, yeah. there's no way to ask via no. the chat. Like, no, no, no. no. Yeah. Like, you have to like really, really, well, you know what? If you're thinking about this, then mm. it should be this. If you're thinking about this other thing, maybe it's this other thing. And I think that is also something that really helped. Um, I feel like I, sometimes people tell me that I have, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, not, not passion, but like energy, energy, energy when I'm presenting, because I get really into it. I remember when I was presenting at Founders Live, I actually apologized to one of them because <laughs> I was getting like aggravated. I was like, no, we need to do something, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I was like, wait, I'm sorry. It's not, it's not you. Uh, I apologize. And I think that uh, sometimes it helps you sometimes no, because they need to be, they, some people need to know that you're in control. Yeah. So talk about, uh, I'm a big believer in this now, like the importance of everyone, like starting at a early age doing public speaking, right? Cause I'm a big thing, like everyone's had to sell something, right? Where they're trying to find a job yeah. or like try to get investor money. Like the point is again in front of people and talking, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, of course, everyone's scared, right? Like I've done public speaking, I'm more, I'm more scared shitless, you know, everyone is yeah. right. But you gotta get and convince people to do your idea, right? Yeah. I think um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, there's there's people that are insanely good at what they do, um, and they don't need to talk in front of an audience. Mm -hmm. But I do think that having the ability to talk in front of an audience is amazing. It's 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 really important. But I don't think everybody. Um, It's like, a, it's, like, it's, like, it's like one of those skills that you need to go through when you're developing as a, as a person. 
Uh, so maybe it's uh, geography, history, math, and uh, public speaking, maybe something like that. It doesn't mean that you're going to go full on history or that you're going to do geography for the rest of your life or that it's going to be critical. But I think it's, it's important for you to go through the experience of doing and seeing what that feels. Maybe you are really good. Uh, or maybe you realize that you will never speak in public. Like that's not for you. Uh, um, if you can develop it, and that's something that you want to do, then that's fine. You can do that. Um, but I think more, more, as I'm thinking about this, I think more, more, I would incentivize for some level of, um, what do you call it? Uh, oh, it just escaped my mind. Like being comfortable with yourself and just yeah. being confident is what I wanted to say. Confidence. I think confidence um, will go a long way, no matter what you do. I think a lot of people realize when they do like do public speaking, like, you know, if you're in front of a crowd speaking on whatever subject, the people that call it automatic is presume you're a subject matter expert, right? Mm. So you always have a heads up on them, right? They're not yeah. like, you know, Jason speaking, he don't know shit about HR, like, you know, or like Alan speaking, he doesn't know shit about tech or, or recruiting or dev match, right? Like, yeah. they automatically assume you know what you're talking about, right? But of course, you may or may not convince them that you're not, you know, you know, get nervous and say stupid things, you know, so yeah. Yeah, I know your your guy, your sales guy Liam got a very great, great presentation last time, right? It's really good. And that's why I asked, like, how many times you practice? He's like, I didn't practice. I was like, yeah, I figured it right because you just some people are just natural at that stuff, right? Like mm -hmm. me, I gotta rehearse a couple of times, you know. It was funny what I do. Like whenever I like speak in front of public, like I know what I say, but I don't. I don't know what I say, right? <laughs> if that makes any sense, yeah, right? Absolutely. I get I, I like, through that. Yeah, like you know what I want to say, I don't say. You know, everyone you says I did a good job. You know, but like fuck, I, I didn't say this. I didn't say that. You can't stress over that, right? Yeah. As long as you got the idea over that you want to express, I think that's what matters. Yeah, for me, it does not come naturally. Absolutely not. Unless it is a topic that I well, even when it's a topic that I care about a lot, uh, it does not come that naturally, and I have to prepare a lot. Yeah. And so, for instance, I remember one time when I was doing a conference. And I was the person that was supposed to be teaching about some aspect of Java uh, to a group of students. And I come in here with all the confidence, I, uh, with all the confidence that I would be able to talk about this and maybe even learning on the fly. And then in, in during the, the chat, there was a question and I didn't know. And then because somebody was able to ask, ask that question, and then I didn't know. And then somebody else answered. And so they were like, they were like taking over. Mm -hmm. And I was just kind of, oh, I felt really, really, really bad. Yeah. Really, really bad. And the most recent one was when I went back to Mexico to my uh, university where I did my, my bachelor's. And I thought I was going to a classroom to talk about my experiences. And then I get there and it's like 300 people in this massive conference room space. <laughs> you're like, you're like, no one's either I missed an email or no one told me this. What is happening? It was terrible. It was, it was really, yeah. really bad. I mean, you think about, you know, talking in front of three people, 300 people is the same thing, right? But it's not right. It is not. Well, it didn't. It's different energy. But you can see their faces. Yeah. Uh, and you can see um, you can see that they're disagreeing. You can mm -hmm. see that they're bored. You can see when they're on their phone. You can see a, a bunch of stuff. And so anyways, that's that's why I really, really need to prepare a lot. That's why I do the recordings. That's, well, that's why. I, and when I don't, I usually regret it. Yeah, my problem is like I tend to talk fast. So I, when I talk, I give a speech. I, I really got to focus on like slowing down, mm. right? And, and use my words. Come on, how my offer, my, my mind operates. Like if I'm saying the first sentence, my mind is already on, on sentence three or four, yeah. right? So subconsciously, so I try to catch up to the fourth sentence, right? And so I like instead of like saying ten distinct words, like one da 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 da, da right? So I got to That's what I really got to focus on. Yeah, we all have uh, to work on stuff. For me, it's just kind of need to be prepared because mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, I start talking in ways that are like not grammatically correct, mm -hmm. uh, especially in English, uh, because English is not my first language. So I really need to prepare uh, if I'm going to be doing a press. So can you do this? Like this, I think this would be pretty cool to do. I actually think it'd be pretty fun. Like suppose you give them a speech somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say it's an English speaking office yeah. audience. Like you said like two minutes English, two minutes Spanish, like going back and forth. You can better look at people's face like, what's he doing? Like, <laughs> Well, I I think Chicanos do a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, they mix uh, English and Spanish quite a lot, quite a lot. Uh, but of course, if the audience does the same, then there's no problem. Um, but no, I've never tried to do that. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> well, sometimes I, I will do that 
not with Spanish, but with technical speak. Okay. Oh, wow. So yeah. even though I'm speaking English, mm -hmm. I quickly transitioned to something about very, very deep technical aspect that nobody understands. Mm -hmm. And I, you lose them. And so it's it's tough because you care about those things that you want. And this happens to me all the time during my team meetings. Um, I did this very, very cool core infrastructure thing. Nobody else knows about this, but I want somebody to know and to say, that's awesome. Uh, and I will dive into the technical details. And I know they don't like, they're not involved in this aspect of the project. So they don't really understand what I'm talking about. And that is something that I need to kind of go over. Like, I don't, you don't need. To, this brings up a good point. How do you do this, right? So obviously, like, you know, you have like a developer, a designer, a marketer, a salesperson, like make sure like one person each thing, right? So how do you make sure everything sync, right? I think like, how do you make sure like, you know, you have a meeting with a marketer, the mm -hmm. marketer sales, right? Like, how do you make sure everyone sync up in the same page? Yeah. So we follow the Scrum methodology. We have a sprint planning meeting every Monday. And then every single day we meet for 15 minutes, 9 a.m. to do a stand up. And then at the very end, we have a demo, which is what you saw. So how do we come up with the work that we do? Uh, we have uh, four priorities, um, creating problems, having users, having customers, and having investors. And everything we do bubbles up to one of those four core priorities. And um, we just basically together, we say, I want to create, um, so for instance, the brand book. The brand book should be something that inspires the next home, the next landing page. And so in that meeting, we decide, okay, is now the time to do the landing page? Yeah, because we have the brand book ready with the pieces. And then what about technically? Uh, is that going to impact whatever we have today? And then the engineer comes in and says, that should be fine. And so we all get together, discuss that. And of course, you come up with a massive plan and then things start shifting. And that's normal. Um, but that's why we have the daily standups to say, okay, you know what? This front page work took twice what it needed to be. So now we're going to have to push something else. How do you do this? Like, of course, you're the founder. You're all in. You're like, you're consumed about this, right? But you're like, you're like I, I guess you have like students here, your team, people like, you know, kind of part-time, whatever case may be. How do you make sure you don't overwhelm them, right? Like, just like give them a whole bunch of stuff to do. Like, how do you make sure like you give them like, like give them kind of some kind of balance, so to speak. You know, yeah. at the same time, like make sure, hey, I don't, I'm not saying like there must be no more priority, but it should be like kind of up there, right? Yeah. Well, this is uh, something that we actually discussed. Um, I feel that half of the team is in, because maybe because they have other things that they need to be doing, i.e. school. Uh, they're very good at keeping track of like, boom, I stop deaf match, I work my other stuff. And because every day, every single day, we, we uh, reduce the capacity of uh, the, so let's say we have a website that needs to be made and it's 10 hours of work. And the person doing this needs to reduce the capacity by two hours. Everybody works two hours per day. Every single day. And so that is, I think, the structure of just having that. It helps them saying to think, I only need to work two hours. And that's it. On the other case, it is, it is the case for the most creative work, for the designer to go over. And the designer also happens to be Mexican. You know, and so I, I, I that's the guy with the long hair, right? That is the guy with the long, long hair. And so I have, and the lady, she's a front end developer okay. and UX designer. Okay. Yes. And oh, I, that's pretty good. That's the, yeah. doing both of them. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of how the arrangement that we have. So Danielle is the, uh, graphic designers is, is moving into user experience design. And then Catherine is the person that translates that user design. Figma files into front-end designs. And then Kara is the back-end designer that can also do front-end when she- And all three of them, are they all UW students? They are, are. yeah, yeah. Okay. Danielle has already graduated. Okay. But, but they, I mean, we have a fantastic team uh, that is building the platform. Um, I forget where I was going for this. No worries. So two-part question. What's the culture of DevMatch right now? And is this the culture that you actually want to have for DevMatch? Culture. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think, um, oh, I remember where I was going now. Okay. I'm going to answer that first. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
Daniel is also Daniel is also um, um, Mexican. So I happen to know Mexican culture because I am Mexican yeah. myself. And I know that in Mexico, it is very kind of common to, I don't know if this translates well, but like putting the jersey, like putting the company's t-shirts is what the, we say. Well, what we mean by that is just like, even though you're not going to maybe get paid for this, you still do the work. You work really, really hard, extra, more than you needed to uh, because you love the company. That, that's just something we do. Uh, and I say, well, in this case, we, we were having this conversation. In this case, Daniel, um, this is just part-time. You have to do other stuff. And in this case, putting the jersey or putting the t-shirt means stop working when you need to stop working. Like you're not, you're not going to get paid more. Um, we're, we're still going to be here, hopefully. And so I guess just having, I could take advantage of that, of the fact that he's so into the creative work that he spends way more time. Um, but I think it's important to just say, no, I mean, do what you can with the time that we have allotted and then because we also want to learn how long it takes you realistically to do something so that we can better prioritize later. Yeah. So this is, hopefully doesn't sound too bad. I'm about to say, I probably will be like, so I never knew what you just said. And so I know a lot of people say like, I want to hire a Mexican worker to do whatever, right? Is that part of that? Like, you know, cause Mexican workers, Mexican are known for being great workers, right? Is that part of the, is that where that comes from? Maybe. <laughs> um, I do think that uh, Mexicans in general, I saw a study sometime that, they work the most hours, uh, office hours, uh, than some of the other nationalities, more, yeah. than, more than the U.S., for instance. And see that uh, I can see that uh, culture that you have to work really, really hard to demonstrate that you really, really care about the company. Mm -hmm. Why? I don't know. Maybe because you don't want to lose your job. Yeah. Maybe because you want to get promoted. Um, but that's just something that is set yeah but i know like i know like i tell people a lot of time like you know kind of what you just said like being dedicated to the company like you know a lot of people don't have jobs right and the job sucks right and like they don't want to move on I, well i tell people like you know to you know try to try to find a job while you're there try to get value from that job right like try to learn a new skill try to get a lesson from that right like there's yeah. always something to be said for doing a good job right but learn something right i'm not saying stay in a fucked up job and like get taken advantage of, but like yeah. you know you're not i can go from one job to money to tuesday right Right. Take, I don't want to say suck it up, but like suck it up, learn some skills, like take advantage of the most you can, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm going through this transition right now myself. Like uh, I'm going through this uh, entrepreneurship journey and I'm working really hard. But like, am I sacrificing other stuff? Probably. Yeah. So where's the line between making this thing succeed? Do you even need to take it there? If you were, if you were, were making smarter choices, would you need to take this much time to get where you need to go? Yeah. So that's kind of some things, some, something that I really think about. And what people have realized, people say, no, I'll be an entrepreneur. People say, you know, I'll, you know, the timeline, right? They're like, you never know what's coming up. Like you might have a personal emergency, you know, like, yeah. you know, some of your family might get sick, you know, you're like, okay, I have like, I'll make this up. I, I have a hundred thousand dollars savings. I'm put all in my business. Yeah. Well, your, your kid might have surgery. Oh shit. I got to pay $75 for surgery right? or I got to pay for this. You never know what comes up. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, um, I mean happened to the person and, and you need to understand that. And, and another thing that I also understand that I also learned from the masters of science, uh, co a, a person that I was, uh, work not working with, but uh, another student there told me some said something that was interesting to me. I always wanted to work with people that cared about what I do as even as much as I, I do. Like we want people that really, really have some technical recruitment and and coding and engineering and stuff. And I need people that really have, and and then she comes in and says. And she says, no, not everybody's going to care about everything. Not everybody's going to care about your startup. That's your startup. Yeah. They just want to get paid. And you need to accept that. And I said, hmm, that sounds true. Yeah. Sometimes I, when I was working at Microsoft, I was working on things that I didn't really care about. 
I don't really care about this, but I'm going to do it. And I expect to get compensated, but don't expect me to fall in love with this thing. Yeah. And so there, there was a post on Quora a long time ago where this guy put on the on the Quora, like, you know, how do I convince my employees to be as dedicated and focused on me? I don't get why they're not they're all in right. And they, of course, you got blasted, right? Mm -hmm. And if somebody they say to say, it doesn't matter if you gave an employee 95% of the company, they will start not being as engaged as you. Yeah. It's your company. Yeah. Pay them with their worth and leave it at that. Absolutely. And that's, that's one of the reasons uh, why when we started, it was mostly actually exclusively unpaid labor. Mm -hmm. um, it was unpaid internships for everybody. And then as we were making progress with fundraising and through the Johns Foster or revenue, um, we, I, we said no more unpaid internships. Like, I know it sounds very, very, very attractive, really, really attractive, but if we can, we should pay yeah. and it, it's been working fine so far. Yeah. And the team is, is a strong one. Now your, your team is all in Seattle, right? Yes. Is a, is plan of going forward, have everyone in Seattle, are you going to do remote stuff later on or? Haven't thought that far. Um, right now, the. That's kind of, yeah, undecided. Um, okay. I mean, of course, remote things are way to go, but I mean, this Uncle Ernie says, there's nothing like getting person in the same office, right? Now, now, I'm not saying like you should have like, you know, make everyone come to your office nine to five, Monday to Friday. Yeah. I, think it's, I think it's bullshit, but like, I think there's goodness like everyone get in the same place like once a week or twice, once yeah. every two weeks, right? I mean, this, you can't, there's nothing to talk about it, right? Zoom is great, but there's something missing by Zoom. Yeah, I, that's one thing that I do enjoy about kind of the engineering culture and kind of when we created Omega Up, we met once, one time at one cafe in Mexico. And then we said, are we going to do this? Yes. Awesome. Let's go. And then the next few years, we're all online. And I think having uh, the ability to write, to express your ideas in writing is tremendous, mm -hmm. absolutely fundamental uh, if you want to be a distributed team. Because mm -hmm. it's one thing to be distributed, but still be synchronous, meaning yeah. I need to talk that's, to you. That's the big thing right there. One that's by the one. big thing, yeah. So I, I would separate a synchronous versus asynchronous and remote versus on-site. Yeah. So synchronous, we need, whether we are in the office or remote, synchronous means that I need a meeting with you to tell you that the TCP reports need to be turned in or whatever, um, the TPS yeah. reports. Um, another organization might be able to tell you via email or a message, like you need to turn this in. That's it. You do. You take action when yeah. you can. And you can do that whether you're on-site or remote. Yeah. So I heavily, I don't really care that much about remote versus on-site. I care more about sync versus okay. async. Okay, that's a good point. And how do you do this? Like, I think a lot of star fronts messes up, right? So like, like, suppose me, right? I'm like, you know what? We're going to communicate by Slack. Nothing about Slack. But the people work with me like, you know, they prefer Discord, right? Yeah. To me, it makes no sense to say, okay, I like Slack. Eight other people like Discord. We're going to do Slack, right? Mm. Like, uh, you should like communicate the way you people want to communicate, right? Well, it depends with who. Uh, so with my customers, I we usually do dictate, well, not dictate, but like we agree on a common uh, communication mechanism. But if my customer, and this happens all the time, uh, my customer all of a sudden texts, I will text back. Okay. If they call, I will call. I okay. will answer. So you let, you let them take the lead and yeah, just follow up? Yes, yes. We have uh, an agreed upon medium of communication. For, but for the people in the team, that's a different story. Like for us, Discord is the way to communicate. That's it. Why? Because that's where we control, where we have access to access control, where we have all the documents, and where we have all the conversations, where we have all the history, where we have all the um, tribal knowledge about what we're doing. I'm really, really big on, on that. So in front of you, Discord is better than Slack. I don't like like why do y'all pick Discord over all the other choice y'all have? Discord. It was a popular choice. Was it okay? That's it. Uh, that's pretty much it. I know a lot of people like Discord. I haven't got on there yet. I'm a, I'm on Slack, but yeah, I need to look at Discord. I know so many people are on there. There's so many people in there. Uh, I would say uh, maybe a, a reason was because 
everybody at the university uses Discord. Okay. Yeah. So it's kind of the tool of choice. The other thing that I do remember making this comment is that I don't know if this is still the case, probably not. But when I had multiple Slack accounts or servers, I don't I don't know if they call them some servers. Uh, if you wanted to go from one to the other, it would kind of sign you out and take like 10 seconds to reload you in to your workspace. And now you can talk to people in this other thing. But with Discord, what I love is that everybody has one user and then you can add that one user to multiple servers. And then the server, the transition from a server to another server is just like instantaneous. You don't okay. think about it. Yeah. All right. So back to the culture question. So what's the culture of DevMatch right now? And is that the culture you actually want it to be? Yeah. So I think the culture of DevMatch right now is one of structure. Uh, we, we, we have a lot of processes. Uh, like when I say that we do Scrum, like we really do Scrum. Like we track every single hour that gets uh, of capacity. We track how much things we, um, we track how much we think things are going to take. And then as we progress, we download. I mean, I could show you all this stuff and this all stuff is in the, in the Azure DevOps um, website. And so I would say it's, it's a little bit of a, a, a culture where you can expect structure but at the same time, we are a startup. So even though there's structure on how you do things, there's a ton of flexibility, not, not even flexibility. There's the need for autonomy from whoever is employed at DevMatch. So one of the things that I tell the UX designers, for instance, I know you're just graduating and I know that you are just kind of limited in experience, but you're here to tell me what to do. My job is basically a CEO just to hire you, make sure that you get your paycheck and set the vision. Yeah. And then everything else you're going to tell me, you're going to tell me what should we be doing? Why? And you, and not only tell me, you need to convince me because I'm going to have my own opinions. And I'm not saying that as a challenge. I'm just telling you like, what's my nature? Like, if you tell me, Alan, we should be going all in on recruiters. Why? Why are we going all in on recruiters? Well, I just met a recruiter and she seemed like a nice person. Well, no, it's very different, but, but you need to tell me what to do. That's why I expect. Uh, and sometimes that works. Sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes people just- So I'll push back just a little bit, right? Yeah. I mean, you are the CR, right? I mean, it doesn't matter if you're a CR of a four-person company, 10,000 person, you're the CR, right? I mean, do you think, like, I don't say get intimidated, but like, they might, you might say that a lot, but they're like, in their mind, like, okay, he's saying that, but he's still the CEO. I, I can't, like, really do this, right? Yeah, like, that's, that's, that's something that happens quite often, actually, because they'll come, I'll say that. They'll come and say, we need to do this. And I'm like, no. Mm -hmm. They're like, okay. <laughs> they're like, and, and, like, you fail the test. <laughs> Okay. You failed my test. You they're, failed. They're like, okay. But but the, the, what they don't know, or maybe I'm not explaining myself, is that that's just kind of my nature. Like, I want to have a discussion. I want, at the end of the day, I, I normally I wouldn't just say no. I would say, no, I don't think that's right. And they're like, okay, we'll do something else. Right. But what I really want to happen, that's when I, what I really want. That's you say, I'm not paying you to agree with me. I want to you to tell me why you want to do this. Mm -hmm. And when I say, I don't think that's the right idea. I want you to prove, like, tell me, no, 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 this is the right idea because this, 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 and this. And then I'm going to get agitated because I'm going to say, no, we don't have a, uh, like time to do that. And then you're going to be like, but it's critical. You know, that discussion, yeah. that back and forth, that's where really good things happen uh, as opposed to, and then that doesn't always work. And so I have to fall back to, let's do this. It's, Sometimes it is the, the most efficient thing to do. And, and that's another thing I learned in the MBA is that leadership is not like, I have, I have I struggle so much with leadership. It's to define it, to kind of explain it. But I can tell you this. It is not one way of acting. Some people say that, oh, I want to be um, this type of leadership or this. No, you, you learn about the different styles of leadership and then you apply them when they apply, when they, when they are needed. Yeah. And people mess up like 
you have to use different styles of leadership for every people on, on your team, right? Yeah, absolutely. And people are motivated by different things, you know, like like one person might be really close to his grandmother, right? Well, if you're a good boss or good leader, you don't let that guy have time off to go to his grandparents' birthday party, yeah. right? You know, or this stuff. You know, and a lot of people are like, you can't be a one size fit all thing. I don't absolutely. think. Absolutely. I would say so. So many people get that wrong. So next, there's a thing called a uh, proceed, where you're the subject of some kind of business case competition. Yes. Is that is that just recently passed or is it about to go on or? Less than a month ago, yes. Okay. So the less than a month ago, we were invited. Well, actually, one of our advisors told us about this thing. And this is yet another student effort for helping startups in the UW community. So what proceed is, as I understand it, it's an incubator from students for students. Uh, in this case, they were doing a case competition and they were inviting us to be the case uh, competition subject. And that was that was phenomenal. That was um, where we really got a lot of great ideas um, and uh, we really wanted to give them the question. Okay, chat GPT is a thing now. Engineers can solve assessments in 10 seconds. What does that mean? And what is the competition doing? What does that mean for dev engine? What is the competition doing? That's that that was the prompt, more or less. So chat GP, chat GPT is about the minute. So like not maybe two years ago, Web3 was a big, big thing. MCL, Web3 is gonna take over the whole world. Yeah. So chat GPT, do you think is gonna like go the way of Web3 and I kind of go fade away? You think it's like actually something that's gonna like change everyone's life, so to speak. ChatGPT is just a product that is built on top of uh, the large language models. I think large language models are insanely going to change. They're going to shift things. Um, I don't know. They're gonna. They're they're going to have an impact. And I personally was never into the Web three kind of movement. Mm -hmm. I think I sort of understand it. But AI, for instance, for instance, was way much uh, important to me. Uh, it was during my undergrad. It was during when I was in undergrad. I thought my career was gonna go in computer vision, open CV, and all that stuff. I was obsessed. I was I when I was in in undergrad. I was obsessed with creating an algorithm that was um, able to look at a road, look at all the different signs of um, like the road signs, like 50, uh, the limit of the speed limit and stuff like that. And then just prevent the driver, the, the human driver from going over that speed. And I have demos and stuff like that. Uh, and then I went to a, uni a university over there in Mexico and they had a, a computer vision lab. And I was like, whoa, computer vision is so big that it has a laboratory with people where people come in and do computer vision. This is what I want to do. This is my life. And it, it didn't turn that way, but I was always very intrigued and interested in, in, in AI and, and machine learning. And so, yes, I do think that machine learning is going to change a lot of the jobs that we do. For us in particular, the intro a large language model that can produce Code with high confidence that is correct is challenging because most of the technical assessments out there are algorithmic based or data structure based that are easily solved by ChatGPT. Talk about this hackathon you got coming on this Friday. Like, what's the goal on it? How do you put it together? All that kind of stuff. Yeah. So the hackathon is um, our attempt of getting the dev match platform. And are you doing this like by yourself or the what, universal watch is this a solo dev? No, this thing? is uh, exclusively dev match. It's just kind of bring people together and have them solve an assessment. So, so quickly, like but, how you, how are you advertise this? Like how do people find out that this? Like discord, discord. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, and how many people have signed up so far? Uh, just one. Just one. Okay. <laughs> and this is Friday. Okay. We got to put, the what out about that yes yes well we posted it uh on friday uh yesterday okay yeah right. so it's and it's a very kind of impromptu thing is there like any prizes involved or like what kind of problem they solve not in? really no there's no prizes right now so this death match started because of 
competitive programming. In competitive programming, you come in and then you compete, you solve a cha technical challenges, and then, um, yeah, you, you might get a prize or whatnot. We're doing the exact same thing, but with death match assessments. Okay. Death match assessments are different. They test you in real engineering tasks, not algorithms. Okay. So here it matters the type of solution that you write in, sen in, the sen in the engineering sense, in the sense that another human is going to read what you're doing. And when you're writing on a solution for a competitive program, it doesn't matter. Like you can hard code the solution, and it'll work. Over here, we're doing different style. Like here's a problem, here's a real world problem, implement it. And that is something um, that has been in my mind for a long time. Okay. Uh, but, you know, we're losing a bunch of team members uh, that Friday mm -hmm. because the quarter ends. And yeah. as somebody that hires a bunch of uh, a multitude of students, um, that's normal. But I said, okay, let's let's do it. Let's do a big push. Let's have a grand finale, I guess. And so that is what the hackathon is all about. Okay. So next, you were at Microsoft like nine or 10 years? Nine, nine and a half. How do your time at Microsoft help or hurt you at what you're doing right now? Oh, incredible. Both. <laughs> Both. It hurt me because it put me the gold handcuffs, you know? So you're, you're getting all these massive uh, salary bonuses, stock awards, all that stuff. And you are working on incredibly impactful stuff. And you are working with incredibly smart people. So you don't want to leave because you're having a good time. But you also have this. I, I call it like I've heard people call it the Microsoft Country Club. The Microsoft. <laughs> yes, yes. I was I was a member for some time. And I didn't want to leave, even though I I deep down. That's that's kind of a negative. I another thing is that it got me into the rat race. Uh, it introduced me to me wanting to get higher and higher just for the sake of getting higher and higher. Um, I have a couple of friends like, like working different, like big orders at Amazon. And they're like, that was a great startup idea. And like, you know, have something, but like, man, I'm about to get this, this director role, this senior director role. And like, they're like, they can't figure out what they want to do. Right. Absolutely. It's tough. Um, especially I remember my very first promotion. I wasn't expecting it. I was just like, I was so naive. So naive. I still am, but I was so naive even more than, and I come into my meeting and he's like, congratulations, you're promoted. And it's like, they turned the switch. Click. I was like, oh my God, this feels great. This is amazing. So I want to, I want more. Um, and with, with, with more promotions, you get more visibility and more, you get to work on more impactful stuff and all that stuff. So definitely the golden handcuffs were there. Um, on the other hand, it helped me quite a bit. Well, the golden handcuffs helped me fund what I'm doing right now. So that's also positive. Um, but more directly, um, I was in my very last position, we were hiring uh, for a, um, we were hiring another person and we were giving a ton of resumes. And I was going through all the resumes and I'm like, this person has a three-page resume with tons and tons of technologies. And I'm like, this is almost useless to me because, I mean, this person knows Java and this other person knows Java, but like this person read a book last night and then put it on the resume. And this person has actually deployment uh, um, production uh, experience with Java applications in the cloud or something. So there's no way for me to compare. So I'm still going to have to ask the exact same question. So that's that's when I really said, you know, this is this is not right. Like this is this is useless almost. Um, so it really pushed me to pursue deathmatch even more. Uh, the other thing I noticed during my time at uh, Microsoft is that it really formed me professionally in the sense of like um, running projects like Scrum like really being um, very, very good at documenting and just explaining what I what is it that I've done, something that I realized I really, really enjoy. And the final thing is that 
it really matured. It gave me a space to do be entrepreneurial in a safe space. So for instance, right now, this is it. That much is it for me. Like if I fail, my life is not over. <laughs> it's almost over. No, I'm just joking. It's not over. But like, uh, but it's, it was going to hurt, you know? But you can be entrepreneurial at Microsoft doing entrepreneurial things and it's kind of going to be okay. So going back to something else, like why are you such a, like when and why do you become a, such a proponent of Scrum, the Scrum method, methodology? I just think it works. I just think it's been useful. And I think um, it hasn't, it doesn't, well, I guess the downside is that it takes a lot of time, but it's time that is uh, um, saved by not doing things that are not needed. So by doing the sprint planning, it really, really forces you. Like I didn't have principles. I didn't have objectives of things that we needed to do. But when I was running sprint planning, I was like, how do I decide that this is more important than this? And this is going to, this is more important than this. We need principles. So I established the principles. And then day to day, um, like I know from my own people, own collaborators that other startups don't do this and that it's really chaotic in some ways. But some people just say, no, that's just the startup, the startup life. It's chaotic. Well, it doesn't have to be chaotic. It's just like you can provide structure and still be chaotic within that kind of space and then make a decision and then I, move I on. I completely agree yeah. with that, yeah. And, agree. and finally, the demos are amazing because they showcase what we've done to the entire team. I really, really love Microsoft uh, leadership principles. Um, create clarity, generate energy, and deliver success. Create clarity ties directly into the use of Scrum. Like really, we have this massive goal of creating a successful startup. How, what does that look like? What do I need to do tomorrow to get to that massively distant point? So that's creating clarity. So I think I bring that with the Scrum methodology. And within that space, you can do whatever you want. Uh, generate energy. The demos bring massive amounts of energy because they showcase, oh my God, the, the work that my colleague is doing is amazing. Yeah. It's really amazing. I mean, because you can't like do a demo with your company, like it brings some bullshit, right? You're like, you gotta, I don't say put a performance on, you gotta show what you did, right? Yeah, absolutely. And if someone's like, what's the what's saying, like iron shoppers, iron shoppers, iron, right? Mm. You're not gonna, you know, one person's doing great, you came in, oh, whatever, you know, like you gotta, you gotta match, at least attempt to match what they're doing, right? And the other thing the demos bring is that, it pushes you to finish. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I will be done with something and I check it off and everything's great. And I'm going to, I'm doing the demo and then I'm like, oh crap, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And because I'm preparing different the demo because I'm going to show it to the entire team and like, oh, it doesn't work. So now I need to do this other thing uh, that I didn't anticipate, but I only know about this because I had to demo it. I had to use it. Okay. And then the final principle delivers success. Uh, this uh, is something that I want to do. Like, I, th I feel we're doing gradually. Like, we are growing. Like, we have revenue. Oh, my God. Like, a year ago, that was unthinkable. Um, we have recurring revenue, which even, is even better. Even better. Even like, better. people are staying. We have customers referring customers. That is just mind-blowing to, to how we started. We started with just... Uh, layers of intent and just going to events and just kind of a very small website. And um, I, I, I like that Scrum forces you to deliver success, like show you how you're delivering success. So that's why I like Scrum. What advice do you have for like new developers? A new developer for kind of just growing their career. Don't become a developer. <laughs> Don't be, no, no, no. I would say something that I really get a mentor would be the most clear thing that you can do. Get a mentor. Um, something that someone that you know you um, ad not admire, but like respect and you could never, ever, ever talk with this person because they're so smart but no just do it and sometimes they will say yes and don't just say oh uh 
can I be your mentee? No, like come with a plan. Like it's, it's on you to have a great mentor. Find the things that you need to get better at, create a plan. Well, not create a plan, but like um, just kind of have a very good understanding of what you want to get and then go to that mentor. And then maybe don't even say the word mentor in the first meetings. Just say, um, I have a question. And I know you're really, really good at this. And I just was just wondering if I could ask you a few questions. And then once that meeting goes well, and they see that you're really interested and that you're taking their advice, then just say, hey, next month, I'm having this other project. Uh, would you mind? And then it's going to become a mentorship. Don't just come into the first meeting saying, I need a mentor. And will you be my mentor? Will you be meeting me for me to one hour every month? Something like that. Yeah, that would be my advice. Who are your mentors? The first mentor that I had, like a true mentor, was um, somebody that I met at a conference. I don't, I don't know if she was the first mentor, but she was certainly one of the most impactful mentors. Um, I met, I, I went to a nonprofit conference because I wanted to learn more about nonprofits because I was running Omega up, and I saw her going. Going to, I was going to all the finance workshops because uh, that's what I was lacking. I don't really understand finance. And I saw that she was going to all the finance sections as well. And then at the very end of the conference in Bellevue, I uh, saw her leaving. And I just grabbed some courage and I said, I, I reached, I, I ran, well, not ran, but like kind of said, hey, uh, I noticed that you went to all of the finance uh, sections of this uh, conference. Uh, I have a bunch of questions. Would you be open to speaking with me? She said, yes. Okay. And then we met. And then I remember bringing um, the balance sheet and the income statement and a few other things. Very, very basic stuff that I had no idea about, uh, that I had no idea anything about. And she was a nonprofit finance uh, kind of, that, that was her field. And she just kind of said, well, this is how you do it. This is how you balance. This is how you should balance a uh, balance sheet. And well, not that deep, but like the basics, the very basics, very basics. And then we met again and then again and then again and then again. And then she up to the point where I said, you, I want you to be, I would love for you to be on the board of directors. And she said, yes, after some discussion. And then, yeah. You, you mean board of advisors, right? No, board of directors. Board of directors. It's okay. So, that is a big deal. Yeah. So board of directors. Um, and then she, to this day, we haven't spoken much since then because that was mostly for the, when I stepped down from being the CEO of the nonprofit, then kind of didn't, don't have as much contact, mm -hmm. but she's uh, amazing. She, yeah. Her name is Amanda. Who are you maturing? I, for the most part, like to think that um, many of my employees or the people that work at DevMatch, so for instance, some of my one-on-one -on -one meetings are just like, we're going to talk, we're going, I'm going to give you a news article or, or something and then you're going to read it. I'm going to read it. And then we're going to talk about it. And that's been great. Uh, and then I also, I'm also an instructor at something called Young Entrepreneurs Academy, uh, which is kind of an accelerator for high school students. So I spend a lot of, a lot of time with high school students, um, just kind of teach, well, not teaching, but like instructing or just kind of guiding them through the journey of being an entrepreneur. So what are things things that you like or and don't like about being an entrepreneur? That I like the freedom, sometimes too much freedom. Sometimes there's like infinite possibilities. You don't know how to move forward. Um, it's just exciting. So much, there's just like adrenaline. There's just, just like, the thing that you're doing has not been done before. 
And and I think that is really, really and I and I and, and one of the biggest things is I maybe I think having a sustainable build business is one of the most challenging things that I will ever do in my life. Like it is incredibly difficult. And maybe it's just because I choose ideas that are not ideas, but like the things that I choose to work on are maybe in my mind rather difficult because it's not a um, moon, moonshoot kind of thing. It's kind of and it's gonna it's it's some sort of 10 year incremental improvement over what we have today. It's not slightly better. It's a 10 year improvement over what we have today. And I think a lot of people expect entrepreneurs to have this massively brilliant idea that is going to take people to the moon. Something like that. So that is that is something that is both good and bad. Things that I that I don't like are that making tough decisions uh, in terms of like saying no to an employee uh, or you you recruit a bunch of people well in the process of in the process of recruiting so many uh, uh one even job description you have to engage with i don't know 50 in my case and then out of those 50 10 are really good out of those 10 five are really 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 good and three you really really want to hire and saying no to the other two is has been really really tough like don't take this like you're amazing you are really really amazing uh the other thing that is a negative is that um it's kind of long hours yeah it's it's tough to keep track of your uh, personal life yeah you have a good point. I, a lot of people don't realize this. Like, I, I think stats show that each job has like 250 applications. Those 250, maybe like 10 actually make it the next step, you know. Others 10, maybe like, I always say 10 get a phone interview, interview five. And so many people, like, you know, they, they get an interview, right? They'll get the job. They get kind of like down. It's all right, I get the job. You're like, you're the top five of 250. Like, you're doing something right, right? Like, yeah. it's not like you're like, you get an interview, right? And yeah. it's, it could be, it is so subjective, right? It could be any kind of reasons. And the reason that you're making that person number two could be completely stupid. Yep. Very, very stupid. And so that person could very well be number one. So telling that number two and number three, because you at this point, you have already spent a significant amount of time with them. Yep. And so telling them that. Not easy to do. The, 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 information that i have in front of me is making me choose this yeah. other person yeah you, you you number two could be very well the best person for the job but based on information it's, it's not it yeah yeah and so telling the other people and then something that has happened is that that first choice doesn't work out yeah and then you have to go to the other uh you have to go down the the ranking yeah. people don't realize this how subjective is like example i use like suppose you have like one person doing an interview right and they come, they come do an interview at like a nine, nine in the morning on Monday, right? We'll say nine morning on Tuesday, right? Yeah. And, and they're probably not as qualified personal job, mm -hmm. you know, but like they did the research, you know, so like, you know, they made a couple of jokes, whatever. The, the four panelists had a great weekend, you know, they're all, all happy go lucky, you know, everyone's in a good mood, you know? Yeah. The, 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 the candidate really answered the questions correctly, but like, you know, he has a good personality, people like him, or whatever case may be. And he did a good enough job, right? But still not best qualified, right? So 1 p.m., the best qualified person's job is coming to the interview, right? Yeah. Everyone's like, but at 10 that morning, the one person on the panel found his mother-in-law coming to stay for a week. So he's like kind of pissed now. Another guy went to go get some coffee at, at 11, had a wreck, you know. Another panelist pretty much got yelled at by the boss for something what he was supposed to do, right? So they're all not in the best mood at 1 o'clock, right? And the dude that comes at 1 o'clock, like, he knows everything technically, but he's, he's like, he doesn't like, yeah. And so based on like skills, you should probably hire the person 1 PM, but who's going to get the job? The first person. Right. And I, it's, it's just it's like that, you know, is that, that is, right? Is it wrong? It's fair. Not fair. I don't know, but you know, it's the way life is. Unfortunately, that is correct. Yeah. That's kind of what we're trying to change uh, with deathmatch in yes. some ways. Um, 
because uh, the the talent respects no I don't know I don't know forms mm -hmm. and so talent is in so many unexpected ways so the 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 current um, uh, executive director of Omega Joe uh, he was telling me that there's this university outside of the outskirts of of any big city it's it's just a very 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 small town and yet they have the high, one of the the highest kind of rates of engineering talent that comes to work for big tech i don't know i don't know the highest but like there's a lot of people from that very particular school that is completely separated from the big cities that you would expect that is producing amazingly good talent. And one of the other things that I remember at Microsoft, again, I, I met so many amazing people. One of them, um, Beatriz, and Beatriz was telling me, he, she's also, well, she is very much into improving the chances of unrepresented um, individuals in tech. And she was telling me when we were we were both where I was the executive director of Omega, and she was telling me we met, and she said, "Alan, I just went to this Washington State farming city somewhere over here, and they haven't been out of their community. Like you would think, in the U.S., in Washington State, and yet you have people in communities that don't really know outside of where they yeah. were born. Yeah, a lot of people like that." All you, all they need is somebody that looks like themselves to show them that it is possible to do something different. And to me, that was very meaningful because it doesn't really, it, it's not about teaching them how to do a for loop. You don't have to teach them how to, you don't have to give them a computer. All you have to do is to get them to want it. And they will find the means in many cases, not always, of course. But if you get them to want it, they will find a way to get a computer, to do a for loop, to get a job, to be successful. In, in many cases, not always, of course. And all that you need to get them to want it is to show them that somebody like them was able to do it or was was is doing it right now. So... Um, all you have to do is just kind of be there and tell them sometimes your stories, sometimes what you went through, sometimes it'll match what they are doing. Sometimes it, it was, it was really special to hear from, from her. Yeah. Alan, how does dev match fail? Oh my God. So many ways. Uh, it can fail as a business, but still be a success. Uh, um, in making and improving someone's life. It can fail both in as a business and in improving anybody's life. So fails as a business, if we don't, in so many ways, like we are unable to attract investment that we need to build a platform. It can fail as a business if we are targeting the incorrect in um, ideal customer profile. It can fail if we have a team that simply is unable to create the platform. It can fail if me, I, I say this uh, sometimes, if me as CEO, I am so greedy with the startup that I am unable to incorporate ideas and incorporate people that think differently than me and many other ways, but those are the things that are top of mind. Yes. So talk some more about how DevMesh got started, what you're focusing on right now, what your, your big vision for the company is moving forward. Yeah. DevMesh started because when I was at Omega Up, I realized that we had a massive database of students and their demonstrated skills. And then at the other hand, we have a massive pool of companies that want to hire talent. And it would it was just like 
obvious to me that we could connect the two. And I said, as a nonprofit, we should be able to connect the two. And that will only give us more um, funding so that we can help even more people. But nonetheless, I was unable to help or to guide the startup in that direction. I tried really, really hard. Hired consultants, started the dev work myself. I did a bunch of stuff, but I was unable to work um, an agreement with the board of directors, actually. Um, and I said, you know what? No, this isn't working. So I'm going to step out, really learn what it, leadership means, and then I might do something else. And then DevMatch um, came to be when I was at Microsoft looking at all those resumes. I already knew that this was cooking in my brain, but I already knew that uh, DevMatch was cooking when more, even more when I was looking at all those resumes and I was, I was just like thinking, this is useless. This is just not a great way of finding talent. And we launched at the, during the Masters of Science and Entrepreneurship. I was doing, I was, I, I knew I was presenting my previous startup that nobody understood fully the composable e-commerce. And I was just kind of feeling frustrated. And I said, you know what? I'm going to pivot. I'm going to transition completely. I'm going to shut that down. And then I'm going to uh, work on DevMatch. And so that's how it started. Okay. And what are you focused on right now? Right now we're focusing on, no, well, those those core four priorities, which is uh, creating, uh, having a contributor platform. So the, the point of DevMatch is that anybody can create assessments. So we're focusing on creating a platform where anybody can create assessment. That means incredible UX and technical capabilities that allow you to create technical assessments in DevMatch. Getting users, getting people to actually solve assessments on DevMatch. One of the amazing things that we can do is that if we have an assessment, that tests you on, I don't know, Node.js, web development. And then we give you an assessment on something completely different that you don't know, that for some reason we know you don't know, that is, I don't know, assembly. We can track how much, it, with enough assessments, we can track how much it takes you to learn something new. Why is this important? Because when we were doing customer development interviews, we were asking some of the engineers, what is the most important as a talent that an engineer can have? And they were saying, the ability to learn something new. And so if we can not only know that you know something right now, but we can somehow track and measure how good you are at learning something that you have never seen, that's meaningful. Because now we can show the company, this person knows this right now, and this is their index or their weight or their score on their ad ad adaptability or their ability to learn something new. So that's um, something that we're looking forward to. And how, and how about your, your future? So, yeah, I didn't finish the other, the other two um, priorities. Uh, that was uh, creating users, uh, generating users. Then there's investment. And then there's, uh, I'm sorry, customers and then investments. The future, all these kind of help each other out. In fact, when I put it in the, in the presentation, it's just kind of a circle. And the future for me looks like DevMatch is the platform where you can run technical assessments. So a lot of people give me grief that there's HackerRank, there's LeetCode, there's Codility, there's all those things. But there's no clear winner. When I show DevMatch to candidates, they still tell me this is new. This is amazing. This is something that is different from what I've seen from the other things. And that is something that I don't think I have been able to articulate to investors. So. Everybody thinks that there are a million uh, tech assessment platforms out there, and there are. Um, but our kind of guiding principles are different. My challenge is that with AI and large language models, all of those assessments are in an instant done. And they are now moving on to 
better things. Now that's bad for us because they're going to land here. I had no doubt. And it's good because they are big companies that are looking for the technology where to do this, which means that we can exit through an acquisition. So next question, and obviously don't answer this like some kind of sacred sauce thing, right? But yeah. like, there's so many color languages. I mean, you know, those Microsoft Azure, Rackspace, yeah. AWS, on and on, right? How are y'all building these assessments? That is the core technical problem of DevMatch. We don't build the assessments. We build the infrastructure that allows anybody to create an assessment. What does that mean? So we give you, so all assessments require, I don't know, test cases, sure. They all require some sort of computing mechanism that allows you to run these uh, evaluators. So what we're saying is, let's build that basic infrastructure that allows you to create and run the assessments in the same way that GitHub allows you to put code repositories in. They're not creating like the latest technology in open source. They just are the, infra the infrastructure that allows you to put your open source stuff in here. So that's kind of what we're doing. We're, we want to create the, I guess, the GitHub of uh, technical assessments. Okay. So your platform, is it more for like for non-tech founders versus tech founders? It is right now very much for technical founders. But the hope is that in the future, after we pass the hump of software engineering, much like Stack Overflow ever uh, did, Stack Overflow started with a technical question Q&A site. And then they decided that, hey, this approach of Q&A is really helpful. And it doesn't really have to be about software. It can be about anything, cooking, English, math. So they decided to open the Stack Exchange um, uh, kind of organization. And then now they have a bunch of stuff. That's exactly what we're doing. So we're starting with software engineering because that that's how it started. That's how where the money is. That's where the knowledge is. That's where we know that the pain point right now is because we experience it. But what we want to do is kind of move on to other verticals, other industries. So at some point, you will be able to do a question about marketing. Actually, you can do that right now, but we don't really, that's not what we're laser focused on. But ideally, you can have deathmatch assessments for anything. And that's that's kind of where we're going. Who is your like your perfect customer? The ideal customer profile right this instant is a person that has a set of uh, five or six uh, titles, one of them software engineer, another one hiring software engineer, lead software engineer, that work in a company that is 10 to 99 employees in the state of Washington, that works for a company that produces software as their first, like as their main competency, they produce software. They are probably in charge of a team that is only in charge of writing code, although they understand what is being done, which is important. Some of their objectives are that they don't necessarily have purchasing power for the company and that they oversee this one team exclusively. So that's that's who we're targeting right now. All right. Hey, Alan, can I just go and do this demo? Over fast. Yeah. So Alan's going to do a demo of DevMax. Absolutely. So DevMatch, let me just uh, move this here. DevMatch is, again, a technical assessment platform that allows you to run technical assessments that are simulations of real-life engineering challenges, uh, as opposed to having algorithmic or data structure-based um, questions when you're running interviews. So this is what you would do as a um, recruiting uh, manager or hiring manager. So I have this project demo. You can come into DevMatch and just basically create your project. And then the project is just your way of saying, I wanna hire this one individual or this many individuals with this title and just kinda how long am I willing to set the end and start date? 
there's a description. You might have another um, set of administrators. You also have a problems. You select the problems from the pool of problems that we have. Right now, there's very few, but there's, an, there's, there's a few problems right now that allow you to assess web development, machine learning in Python, and a few other small things in HTML. But the core is that anybody can come in and create their own assessments on DevMatch. And the other thing is that you can actually create your own assessments if you have the time and technical ability to create your assessments. And then you start adding your candidates here. Let's say we invite Alan Gonzalez. And then you put their email and then you invite them. You can have calibration users. Users, celebration users are people that you trust that are kind of good at whatever this task is asking. And then you basically send it to them just to see, hey, what do you think about this assessment? And then whatever they say or they score doesn't really count towards the ranking or the submissions. And that's it. So then you actually send the assessment. We really don't want to create a, uh, an ATS, but that's kind of what's happening uh, behind the scenes. Uh, ATS being the application. Applicant tracking. So right now we use some other uh, technical uh, applicant tracking systems. So now that's it. That's it from your perspective as a recruiter. Let's say you're non-technical recruiter, and then that's all you need. You you send something from the pool of candidates uh, to your candidates, and that's it. If you do know a thing or two about what you're hiring for. You can go to the problem, uh, to the explore page and create a problem. And then in here, you can create a new problem. It can be either public because you can let the community use your assessment or it can be private so that only you can use it. And then in here, uh, we have documentation on how to fill out the all important code aspect. So the code is what basically tells you what are you going to be asking the candidate, what are they going to be evaluated on and all those things. And then, as I mentioned, we have a bunch of assessments right now, but uh, we're building the documentation and the platform so that much more, many more people can come in and contribute. Or well, assessors pass fails are like a grade, like A, oh, B, C, D. I'll show you. So let's say that I invited myself. I actually didn't invite myself because this is your account. But this is what I see. Um, so as a candidate, I received an email and I go into my email and then I click, oh, Jason has invited me. And this is what I see. And what I get is this, the arena. You have one hour to solve this assessment. And They're like they can't take a break. They can't like pause or anything. It's like it's one hour. It's one hour. It's one hour. And I know it's tough, but it's really the best way to really be able to compare one to another. Because sometimes you give assessments and then you, you get a really good assessment answer and you don't know if this person took eight hours. That's why it looks so great. And the other hand, you have another person that submitted something that looks just enough. They did exactly what they were asked to do. They only took 45 minutes. So what we said is just like every single assessment is one hour. And the other thing is that we asked a bunch of candidates, a bunch of um, people uh, that are usually taking assessments. And they said, I am tired of taking assessments that are five, six hours long. So that's ridiculous. right? There. That's, that's, that's kind of the thing. Now, this is an assessment. This is actually the assessment that we created for you, uh, Jason. So as you can see, we have a realistic assessment, which it says, you must complete a few pending resources for this human resources backend service. Uh, you have a GraphQL uh, endpoint uh, that uses DynamoDB, which happens to be the real case. And then here's what I want. The list users unit test is failing because blah, blah, blah. The update user API is broken. Uh, we need a new employee account field. So things that you would come in and ask your developer yeah. if they were coming to work tomorrow. Now, the other thing is that 
as you can see, it is not that we provide you with a. So how do you come up with this assessment, right? Like there's something like you research it on how, I mean, because it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty detailed, right? I mean, like. I do. Ideally in the, in the scaling plan, you would do this yourself or okay. your engineer. Okay. Because we're targeting companies that already have some sort of engineering mm -hmm. capabilities because they hire more. Like startups hire one engineering talent and then that's it for like a year and then they hire more. Um, but ideally, you would already have somebody that knows what they're doing. But see, I think what you're doing, I think this would be golden for like non tech startup founder. Right? Absolutely. I, I don't. Obviously, be more work on your part because, like, you know, like me, I have no idea how to do this, right? Yeah. But I, I think there's so many tech founders, non tech startup founders, like, are going through so many tech people, right? Either because, like, my own story, you know, my own story, right? You're like, it's this has been a, been a fucking a shit field, right? Yes. But like, something like this will help so many non tech founders, like, be successful, I think. Or at least increase the chance of them being successful. Uh, absolutely. Some people... Uh, and maybe you charge the United Tech founders more money. I don't know. Well, that's a great idea. Uh, so, someone called this the uh, kind of your co-pilot mm -hmm. when you're hiring technical talent. And the idea is that you don't have to come up with all this. Like this is custom made for you. Mm -hmm. Like we took the steps. Yeah. But at some point, we're going to have enough assessments that one of them is going to be close yeah, enough close to enough, what... Yeah. So you don't even have to create it. You know, like a lot of tech people, like, you know, they say they're doing, but they don't really do, you know, a lot of, you know, bullshit going on, you know, like, yeah. And the other thing that we did with the pro seed that we spoke about earlier is that we said, well, can we create some sort of coding, um, some sort of program or an, an add-on that is going to create the assessments on the fly mm -hmm. just for you? Like we can go into your website see how it's built, at least the front end, mm -hmm. and just create an assessment just for you. Yeah. Maybe that, that would be amazing. Like, I know you focus, like like you said, engineering teams already, but I just think it's a game changer for non-tech founders, right? Like, if I was a I'd say, hey, like, maybe spend more time, like, focus on non-tech founders, right? Because, like, I know so many non-tech founders here in Seattle have trouble, like, finding tech talent. This would, like, be a godsend to them. It will be. It will be a godsend. Uh, At a cost, of course. And, and, let me show you how I, as a candidate, will do this. So I come in and I look at the Git repository. And again, this is not given to you. Like it's not pre-made. Like you need to know how to use Git. Git being the version control system that this uh, use uh, this problem uses. And again, the Git service is not really tied to this problem. It's not really tied to DevMatch. It can be anything. You can use anything. Uh, you can use GitHub. We have problems that use GitHub, actually. and But in this case, we use a, a private Git repo that is hosted by us, that is created just for you. So in this case, we say, I don't know, the update user API is broken. So now I need to kind of look for where this thing is. And this, the thing that I'm doing right now, is essential. So... You don't want somebody that just kind of, you tell them what, what to do and they look for it and then, oh, I found it. Yes. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> navigating code from somebody else that somebody else wrote, massive, massive uh, skill that you need to have because more times, uh, more often than not, you're going to come to projects that have already been created for you, that have been created by your previous developer and then the previous developer and then the previous. So what you want is somebody that knows where things are. And maybe the names are not kind of the best, but that's kind of reality. Like uh, this, let me be honest with you, right? Yeah. So it, it is for some people that apply, that is massive. We get people that apply, open the assessment, and then they bail mm -hmm. because they don't really know how to do it. That's great because you save them time. You save your time yourself. And even though they don't know what they, this, uh, they don't know how to fix it in the one hour time slot that they have, what is being asked of them in the job. Does anyone come back and say an hour is not enough time? Hmm. They say, well, some of the recent feedback that I remember is that this is certainly something that is 
pressured, like it, there's, you feel the pressure mm -hmm. of the one hour thing, but it's not undoable. Yeah. It's definitely not undoable. This assessment that I'm showing you right now is, is, is brand new. So we'll probably have to tweak it. And, and you did all this yourself or were your developers who did this? This one I did myself. Yeah. The developers work on everything else. So for instance, okay. the arena, the actual arena, like the submit, the time left, the all everything, okay. like all the structure that the other developers did. But the assessments are always But definitely always. sometime pretty soon you gotta like let, let other people do this, right? Yeah. Obviously you can't do it yourself. As a matter of fact, scale. today this sprint is when for the very, 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 very first time in the history of Deathmatch, somebody else is, is creating an assessment. Okay. So that's amazing. Anyways, uh, you come here and then you make changes. Uh, let's say uh, here is my change. This is just a comment. Mm -hmm. It is not going to be meaningful to anything. Now, how do you push your, your changes? You, I mean, you did something. How do you push it? You do a commit. Why? Because that's what you would do. on the real uh, job, and then you push. And then I typed really, I typed fast, but what I did stops people. So even just from the Git URL to the where you have the code, there so some people say, oh, it doesn't work. This GitHub repository doesn't work. I'm like, no, this is not a Git repo. This is uh, this is not a GitHub repo, it's a Git repo. And if you worked, if you have some experience, you'll know that this is not, not a GitHub. This has nothing to do with GitHub. GitHub for some reason. And then again, you push, and then here's uh, where we come in as Deathmatch. You submit. Now the submission, what it's going to do, is going to take what you've done and run through some tests. And now you have this thing. And now this thing is going to automatically evaluate against the test cases that we have given you and see if what you've done really does indeed um, satisfy the test cases. So this is critical because number one, it tells the candidate what they're missing. If they score zero, now they know why. If they score a hundred, now they know why. And this is another, this is the other pillar that during the customer development interviews we learned. We don't, some people spend their time doing the, an assessment and they don't get any feedback. They just get ghosted. And so at the very least, you now know by using DevMatch that, hey, you got all the test cases. So basically you're adding value to these candidates. To you the know, candidates. At, at, at no cost to them, right? To the candidates, yes, just by participating. And that accrues to the value that they uh, um, kind of relate to the so company. You have, you have, so you have all these developers get better. Y yes, yes. What happens if someone is, like accidentally clicks submit? Can they like what happens? Like, can they they can submit again. They can submit okay. again. I can submit again. Uh, okay. So okay, so you, like you can take the assessment multiple times. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Each one has to be within an hour. Okay. Yes, okay. yes. So right now we have some time left. So I uh, click submit, and right now this thing is being evaluated, and it'll give me an assessment of how well I did on every single test case that I'm that I'm doing right now. From the assessment you've done so far, like what percentage of people have actually, like I say, like passed the assessments? That depends on the assessment. Um, so we have an example over here. So let me give, let me give you an example. So now I'm going to go back to the recruiter dashboard. Let's say that you sent out your assessment to a hundred candidates or so, and now you're back. You want to see how they did, and you look at the pipeline. And the pipeline tells you, okay, so I had 51 candidates that I sent out this to. Uh, 10 of them were invited for some reason. I didn't invite, maybe because they didn't have authorization to work in the US. So I only invited 10. Eight opened the problem and eight completed the problem, but only six actually- That's, that's interesting that two didn't submit after they completed. That's, that's interesting right there. That happens all the time. Does it? Yeah, because you think it's because like they, they think they didn't go to, didn't do good, didn't do a good, good job at it. They or? don't understand what's going on. Yeah. Um, in some cases, like they and, and they know it and they tell us, uh, which I very much appreciate. 
yeah. they come into the assessment. They are because when you're applying, you apply to a hundred jobs, yeah. right? Yeah. And then some of them you don't really know what you, mm -hmm. what's going on, mm -hmm. but you still apply, mm -hmm. and then you might pass the interview, but you don't really know. But if you complete it, you would think you'd like you take one extra step to submit the button, right? I mean, yeah, but some people just come in, read it, and number one, they either don't like we're saying, they're like, no, I don't really know graph or something, mm -hmm. or they don't want to. Yeah. That is the other massively important thing. So they say, oh, you know what? I don't want to work on web development more. Mm -hmm. I want to work on iOS. And I see that this is web development. Yeah, like with assessment, you don't actually say the name of the company, right? Uh, but like you no. don't say this assessment for Kevin's HR, this assessment for like you know, ABC mm -mm, company, mm -mm. okay? So, it's not like they get like, like they like you know, this assessment for Kevin's HR, let me use this Kevin's HR, but ain't no way in hell I want to work for this guy, right? Yeah, okay. In your case, we did it because you said, Yeah, it's okay to yeah. use your name, yeah. uh, and your code and all that stuff. Uh, but in other cases, we don't use it, okay? And then the colors here are the sources. Uh, the different sources. Maybe some of them were recruited via LinkedIn. Some of them were recruited via Handshake. Yeah, I remember seeing that. Yeah. So you know where people are coming from. And some people submit, some people don't. And this is the all important ranking. But let's say nine, eight people that submit it. So Laura got 100. Laura That's got 100. 100. So you can see, okay, Laura opened the project on this time, this time. Uh, and then they immediately scored a hundred. One thing I like about this, like, let's suppose like, I'm making this up, you know, don't yeah. take this personal people. Listen, like, suppose you have a company, right? And you're like, you know what? Let's, let's suppose Laura is like a redhead from, from, um, Ohio. Right. Yeah. And you're like, you know, from Michigan, you hate people in Ohio, right? Mm. You know, like I'm a fan. I hate Ohio people, you know, whatever case may be, but you're like, damn, the business person, like, fuck, she's got a fucking hundred. Yeah. Like maybe I can overlook her being from Ohio. Right. Well, Which I really like about this. You're alluding to a feature that we have not implemented, mm -hmm. only talked about. But when you do this process, if you can choose to do that in the settings, or so you will be able to, you won't see their names. Okay. So you cannot see. So you all you have to do is just send the assessment, mm -hmm. wait a few days, and then say, give me the top 10%. Yeah. And then only then you will see who's who. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, we see people that submit it. Uh, let's take a look at Laura. So let's say you have an engineer on your team. Uh, you can take a look at exactly what is it that they change. So in this case, this is a demo. So even though I changed something else, I'm see we're seeing something else. Uh, but this, you can see their code. You can see Laura's code and see how well they did. And the very important thing is that you can use this as a starting point for the final round of interviews. Yeah. So you can come, you can invite Laura and say, you're invited to the interview and we're going to go over your solution. Mm -hmm. So you're going to ask questions about why did you do it this way? Why not this way? What are the downsides of your implementation? All those things. And that is just a much better way of doing an interview rather than starting from scratch, even though they already spent time, an hour, understanding this problem. Yeah. I mean, I suppose you interview these four people, right? Laura, Kathy, Lee, and, and Rio, right? To me, like Laura is like his above everybody else, but, but then again, like you gotta work with people, right? So maybe Laura is like a toxic person, right? And mm -hmm. this, you know, and maybe the person who scored 25, like say, like, I love no, I love this, I love that, you know. Yeah. So it's an indicator of a man, like you can't ignore 100, right? It's it is an indicator. And what we're saying is that this is only like a screening assessment is mostly for who do you not want to hire, mm -hmm. not who you want to hire. Yeah. It's just, who do you not want to hire? Mm -hmm. You can now spend your time talking to Norton, Kathy, Ryo, Lee, and Laura, mm -hmm. you know, and you're going to have five meetings and you're going to spend some time with them. And, yeah. but guess what? They already, well, not Norton, but both the top four already demonstrated that they have some idea of what needs to be done. Yeah. So you won't be sp uh, spending time with the other yeah. 51, yeah. you know? So that's that's where we save and this is so powerful this is a time saving it is so much time saving and startups have like time is such a precious commodity and and here's the massively good part part that i like to emphasize for your case in particular jason this is your code mm -hmm. 
This is your code. This is this is Kafnis HR. So when they match this, when they match your um, interview for cultural fit, and then they start working the next Monday, they already know. Yeah. You already know that they know. They demonstrated this to you. Yeah. That's the power of that much. Seems to be a powerful thing. Definitely got something here. And then, of course, um, you can come in as a candidate and then just solve problems for fun, mm -hmm. for fun. Um, and because um, Is that, are you, are you going to gamify that some kind of absolutely, way? absolutely. That's that's why that was the main um, aspect of one of our UX researchers, Hannah. She spent a lot of time. She she created two papers on how we're going to gamify this thing. So, anyways, this this is that much. Nice. Thanks for the demo. Alan. Absolutely. So, um, what's um, how do people reach out to you on social media? Well, I am mostly active on LinkedIn, and I have a Twitter account that I used to be more active on, <laughs> and that's pretty much it. I spend most of my time on LinkedIn. Okay, is there anything that I should have asked you that I had to ask you yet, or anything else you want to talk about? There's one thing that I love to talk about, which is customer development. I am obsessed with customer development. And that is the one thing that I learned with Deathmatch, as opposed to my other startups, is how you do customer development, um, or more specifically, customer discovery. So customer discovery is done by doing interviews. And the most important thing that I wanted to mention is that it is not about you going to your potential customer and telling them about your idea. And because if you do that, you're just going to introduce a ton of bias. You're going to tell them that you care about this, that if they don't like it, they're going to hurt your feelings and all sorts of things. And if you come and you tell them, I'm working on this idea, I've been working on this for a year, let me, uh, here it is, what do you think? Well, most people are going to say, this is amazing. This is great. You're, you're amazing. You're, you're, uh, you're going to be a, a, a rich entrepreneur or something like that, you know? They don't want to hurt your feelings. Will they even buy the thing if it existed? Absolutely. Well, most cases, no. So what you need to do is go to your target uh, customer profile and make it about them, 100% about them. Who are you? Just to make sure that they are indeed the right uh, individual that you want to be targeting. What are wh what do you spend most of your time on? What... Um, what are your struggles? What do you hate the most about this? Uh, and then slightly introduce the process that you're working on. What do you like about recruiting? What do you dislike about recruiting? If you had a, a magic wand, you could do anything about recruiting technical talent, what would it be? And guess what? At the end, they might not even mention anything about technical assessments. And that's fine. But you need to record that. You need to be able to say, well, you know what? We talked to 50 people and none of them said anything about technical recruitment, technical assessment platforms. And that's huge because even if you have a massively, insanely good technical assessment platform, if people are not looking for it, you will not succeed necessarily, or it's harder. You need to do it some other way. But they need to some ways be affected by this problem and in the process of looking for alternatives. Otherwise, they're not going to look for you. Otherwise, it's a problem that they can live with. Otherwise, it's just something that is just a pain in the ass, but like, it's not that big of a deal. So I'm not incentivized to move to something new. So you need to come in, learn about them, see what they want, see what they need. And then you do the second part of the interview. You know, that's a good that's a good point. A lot of entrepreneurs don't realize that their competition is like another company. A lot of the competition is like a person that's not changing their ways, like doing mm. the same, like like just still doing Excel or yeah. you know, like you know, back machines, right? Or you know, not want to change. Why would they? I mean, yeah. it's more more. It's a lot of pain to change something that is already implemented. And yes, you hate it, but is you, you hate, hate it enough? It enough. Yeah, do you hate it enough to be looking for alternatives? Like I, I don't know, I'm not, you know, I'm making enough profit. I have a good living. Like why improve? You know, absolutely, yeah. 
So, and if they are not looking for new alternatives, then you're not a painkiller, you're a vitamin. Sure. A vitamin, a something that uh, you could be better at if you use it. It's not immediately obvious, but it seems good. You could take it and it would be good for you. A painkiller is something that you absolutely cannot yeah. work if you don't have a painkiller. Yeah. That's a damn good analogy right Well, there. it's it's not mine, unfortunately. No, it's not. <laughs> it's something I learned in the in the business school. Yeah, man. That's fucking that's a classic quote right there. It is very popular. Yeah, yeah. Painkiller versus vitamin. Yeah. Oh man. You're looking for you're looking to be the painkiller, mm -hmm. not a vitamin. You don't want your your customer to be I'm not gonna buy if, if they don't buy the vitamin mm -hmm. this month, nothing's gonna happen. Yeah. You want them, you want their world to collapse. Either if they don't have you, I like the quote a lot. <laughs> um, I was gonna ask you something else. I got brain locked. Um, well, I was I was uh, about to mention the second part of the interview. Okay. Of the customer development. So now that you know uh, what are their pain points, now you collect some of the data, and then you go again, mm -hmm. and now you do the product uh, discovery phase, which is like, hello, Jason. Uh, if you recall, we had a meeting the, the other month. And you mentioned that you had this problem, right? Yes. You mentioned that maybe a problem like this would be solved by something, a product that would look like this. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. In that case, and only in that case, you come in and then you show your demo. And you, you tell them, okay, here's a demo. And then at the end, you ask, yes, I would love that. Yes, yes. How much would you pay it? Uh, $200 per month. I would pay $1,000 per month for this. Okay. Uh, what are the disadvantages? You start asking questions about this specific thing. They're like, yes, very uh, intrigued. And then what do you do next? Give them a letter of intent. Mm -hmm. And then you write, I, Jason Kavnas, would buy this thing for $1,000 because that's what they said. Um, if this per if this thing were to exist, contract is not binding, and then you give it to them, and then you see if they sign it. Yeah. And guess what? The guy for for me, the guy that said I would pay a thousand dollars, not not didn't sign. He didn't sign it. Didn't sign it, even though it's not binding. Yeah. But that's yet another way of you getting kind of the attention, not the attention, but like the um. Extracting the truth from the customer, what they what they really want and what they what they really would pay something for. And so, anyways, after that, there's there's more phases. But notice the most important thing here is that you didn't have to build anything to get to this point. Yeah, yeah. So um, you've bootstrapped so far, right? Mm, well. Not really, because I invested myself, my own money. I mean, so who's definitely right? I mean, <laughs> and then the John's Foster, which gave us another 25K. So I would say it's half and half. Um, and But we're not, we haven't raised from an institutional okay. investor. Like you haven't like done a PC or something like that? No. Are you going to do that like anytime soon? Or are you still like, you still have like metrics and tracks you want to gain first? I do have metrics and tracks that I want to get to. Um, but I think... You you can start fundraising. Uh, I will start fundraising very soon, and I'm leaning towards angel investors right now. Uh, I've met with a lot of VCs, and I think we're not ready for them yet. Mm -hmm. And I want to find somebody that sees what we have mm -hmm. for the value that we provide right now more than for the business. Yeah. At some point, this is going to be a business that is going to be a no brainer that every that people want to invest but right now where we are it's more about we need somebody that is probably an angel investor that is aware that this is a problem mm -hmm. and that this is a potential solution yeah. to that problem and that is willing to put some money into it cool. um so anything else you want to talk about no i think that's okay, cool. well I, I feel bad because i didn't ask you any questions no that's fine <laughs> that's fine that's fine um so can you give us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about before we get out of here um no, I think um, just kind of 
have fun <laughs> <laughs> is what I would say. Take care of your family and uh, yeah, just have fun. Thanks. Yeah, Alan, thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason, for inviting me. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.